Recording in progress. All right. All right. We'll bring the meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to order. This is the meeting of February 13th, 2024. Uh, first item of business, we'll have the clerk um, call the roll call. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Cummings? Here. Um, is there any member of the board who would like to dedicate the moment of silence to anyone? Uh, yes, thank you. Mr. Chair, is that on? Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, adjourn in memory of uh, Robert Brainerd III. He was the gentleman, uh, 45 years old, who was killed when a tree fell on his house in uh, Mula Creek during the storm. Uh, Robert Brainerd III, um, his uh, significant other, was able to get out, but uh, he didn't. Is there anyone else we'd like to dedicate this moment of silence to? Seeing none, I will take a moment of silence for Robert Brand at the third. All right, if you could all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Next item on our agenda is consideration of late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions to consent and regular agenda. So I'd like to ask the um, administrative officer, uh, Carlos Blas, if, if there's any additions or deletions. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Cummings, mem members of the board, we have one correction. This is on the regular agenda, item number seven. There's additional materials that are added, revised attachment D, packet page 66, with 66 which is replaced. The scheduled hearing date should read Tuesday, okay. April 9th, 2024 at 9 a.m. And that concludes the additions and corrections to the agenda. Thank you. Um... At uh, this time, I'd like to uh, ask if there's any board members that would like to remove any items from the consent agenda to the regular agenda. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'd like to remove um, item 23, which is an item from Supervisor Koenig and myself regarding the AT&T application. My understanding is AT&T would like to also uh, speak to this item. I think it'd be important for them to address the community. We'll just put it on the regular agenda. Okay, sounds good. Um, are there any other board members that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move item number 23 to the regular agenda. And is it possible for us to hear that item first on the regular agenda? Yes, it can be heard in whatever order. Okay. okay so that item will be moved and will be, uh, wait, I guess, what number would that? You can make it item 6.1. Okay, item 6.1 on the regular agenda. All right. At this time, I'd like to open it up to public comment. This is an oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on any item that is not on the agenda, the regular agenda, or if there's an item that's on the agenda that you would like to speak to at this time because you may need to leave. Now's an opportunity for you to speak to us on any item on the agenda. Uh, and so we'll, if you'd like to line up at the podium, uh, you'll be given two minutes. Good morning. My name is Steve McGurk. I'm here representing the Santa Cruz group of the Sierra Club. I've come to speak in support of consent item number 24, the phasing out of gas powered blowers by the County of Santa Cruz. In 2020, the Sierra Club was approached by Chase, the, the cons 
uh, we, I'm going to call it the Committee for Health and Safe Environment. Chase approached us with a very compelling um, PowerPoint presentation on the dangers of using uh, gas-powered leaf blowers. Um, a letter went out to the county and the four cities in June of 2023, and hopefully some of you have been able to read these. I won't go into them in depth. In 2022, the state acted to um, impose uh, Assembly Bill 1346, which last January banned the future sales of all gas-powered uh, landscape equipment, including leaf blowers. This ban was a great step to the future, um, but it did not do some critical things. It did not ban the continued use of gas-powered blowers. And again, going back to the letter that we submitted to you, uh, the dangers inherent in doing so. In 2022, also, um, this, the California Air Resources Board enacted the core program, a program aimed at offering uh, rebates for contractors and related retail businesses uh, towards disusing gas-powered blowers. Unfortunately, the Achilles heel of this whole program has been no recycling endeavors. Then last year, in 2023, November, uh, the, the um, Monterey Bay, excuse me, sir, could you please? The Monterey Bay uh, Air if Resources you, District. If you could please wrap up your comments, your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Schwartz. I'm running for supervisor to replace Jack, uh, Zach in the next election. Um, I'd like to ask the board to please remove item 16 from the consent agenda. And the reason I ask that is I think that any changes to the county code should have public input. We need to have the public involved in things like this. Um, one of the things about the Coastal Commission that I find a little um, bothersome is that this was a commission that was created by the state of California to usurp the authority and ability of local governments to effectively regulate their coastal areas. And we are having nothing but problems with them all the time. So I'm asking you to take this off the consent agenda so that we can talk about this and reach a better understanding of where that commission could play their role and where we should be responsible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please approach the podium. Good morning. There are four of us here together this morning and we have a prepared statement that we're gonna share with you. And first, I'm going to read a disclaimer. The information and opinions that we are about to share do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Santa Cruz County Human Services Department, management, or directors. We're not here to represent the county or make requests on behalf of the county. We are here to share our independent thoughts, opinions, and experiences as citizens of Santa Cruz County and as social workers, who work with local families in the CalWORKs Family Stabilization Program. Our names are Barry Domer, Uni Pomper, Sarah Voorhees, and Kevin Kilgore, as well as Lisette Gonzalez and Victoria Regan, who are at the office providing coverage for our team. We are the social workers that comprise the CalWORKs Family Stabilization Team. This letter is in direct response to California Governor Newsom's state budget update number one, proposed budget for 2024 and 2025. Page nine indicates that to save money in the next fiscal year, the government is proposing to eliminate the family stabilization program. We feel strongly that eliminating this program and the high intensity work that we do with some of our community's most vulnerable and at risk members would be a significant disservice and loss and would create an overwhelming detriment and hardship for the families we currently serve and for the future families that would not be able to receive family stabilization services. Thank you.
Our team serves CalWORKs families experiencing personal barriers and crisis situations that impede their ability to participate fully in employment services activities, formerly known as the Welfare to Work Program. We are a highly skilled team of social workers with specialized knowledge in areas such as securing resources to assist with homelessness, mental health crisis, suicidality, domestic violence, substance abuse assessment and treatment, legal issues, and child abuse and neglect prevention. The work we do involves providing crisis intervention and intensive case management to help alleviate barriers and stabilize families so that they may ultimately pursue employment and education-related activities with the goal of obtaining self-sufficiency. We each are also clinically trained in treating trauma and complex human behavioral issues and often are the singular safety net resource for our families. Losing funding for our program would result in the following negative impacts on families. Increased homelessness in our community, increased mental health crisis and suicidality, increased untreated substance use disorder, increased number of victims of domestic violence who are not getting help, increased exposure to childhood trauma and adverse childhood experiences, increased referrals to child welfare, and increased reliance and time on public assistance. Additionally, the loss of the Family Stabilization Program would result in increased strain on safety net services, such as emergency rooms, jails, police, paramedics, and the criminal justice system. Our work is heavily focused on prevention and serves to offset the costs the county would otherwise incur. Thank you. It is important to note that this program in Santa Cruz has been serving families since 1998, well before the California State Legislature passed AB 74 in 2013. Prior to AB 74, the Santa Cruz County CalWORKs social work team was funded via the single allocation, and we provided the same services that we do now. AB 74 recognized the important need and unique benefit that the Family Stabilization Program brings to CalWORKs families experiencing instability and barriers to employment. Since January 1st, 2014, California has been funding this important work in all counties in recognition that family stabilization can provide families with increased level and intensity of case management by staff who have the training, skills, and experience necessary to provide case management to families and individuals in crisis. We as Santa Cruz County citizens are respectfully urging each person in a position of influence on the California and local budget to truly consider the consequences if funding for the Family Stabilization Program is cut. We sincerely believe it would be a step backwards for meeting the needs of the state and county's most vulnerable populations and the trickle down effect would be seen and felt by the whole community. As a team, we are committed to carrying out the mission statement of the California Health and Human Services Department, which is enhancing the health and well-being of all Americans. In addition to the mission statement of the Santa Cruz County Human Services Department, which states that we strengthen our community by protecting the vulnerable, promoting self-sufficiency, alleviating poverty, and improving the quality of life. We love the work that we do, and we care about the families we serve. We as a concerned group of social workers and citizens are hoping that the proposal to eliminate family stabilization will be removed from the May revise. However, if it is not, we are appealing that the board to the board for funding to be reinstated locally through the single allocation or other funding so that the family stabilization program may remain in place in Santa Cruz County. We implore you not to eliminate the CalWORKs family stabilization program as you'll be removing essential services that most impoverished and vulnerable families in our community rely on for basic needs and safety. Thank you for your time to hear our concerns. We appreciate your shared commitment to the well being of the families in our community. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I'm addressing the uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. What is it? February 13th, 2024. You know, it's really quite interesting. You know, I'm kind of sad to announce that um, I'm going to be stopping showing up and publicly speaking. So now there's an example that I at least have something in common with you lying sacks of shit. 
is that, that you guys are lying sacks of shit. Excuse me, sir. I'd like you to please watch your language. This is something that's being oh, called being the polite. I can be much more direct. So I'm looking at this, and I meant what I said. Last week, I voted for all of you guys for life in prison. Once again, I'm being polite. So to stay on topic, you know, I did do some looking up point of order for how I could interject when some of you buffoons after community members talk, try to belittle what they're saying. I'm going to remind the community that Agenda 21 clearly came into this county. It was introduced through the SEEDS project in 1993. And when you guys go over these little murder puppet things of taking more people's stuff away, and other people bring up that this has been an agenda that's been in this county for decades, we need to call you guys on your stuff. So just as I copped up to me lying to you guys, I expect some stuff out of you guys because people can change. And I'd like to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman, Supervisors. I noticed again the names change, but nothing changes. Mr. Cummins, we're back to two minutes. I think it was brought in by Bruce McPherson, who received $30,000 from a red Chinese communist spy, triple spy, according to U.S. News and World Report. Uh, and we've got five-year plans out there. Where have I heard that before? Uh, it's not clarified in there. And I, I call Mr. Manu, we just uh, we just dedicated to a lady or a man that got killed by a tree. I've been trying to call this man's office. You all have one receptionist before you used to have your, your recep personal receptionist and you'd have one or two of your staff members that you could email to. You've shed all that responsibility and you're following the United Nations programs. Agenda 21 is clear. Sam Farr, who lied himself to death and said he had nothing to do with it, signed the formal page that this county adopted. And he says he's, he's pushing it into other areas, too. This comes from uh, the British Fabian Socialist Society about regionalization. And they were working with Lenin to set up Soviets. You have CalCog. There's not a person in this county that knows about CalCog. There's not an elementary kid that they have or high school kid or up in the uh, university. Or do you ever publicize uh, the AMBAG meetings, which is no more than a Soviet? 13 cities and three counties. It's all backroom stuff for the Panettas, the Packards, and the Driscolls. You guys are to have a backroom that's nuts. And you do not even read. I, I don't make sure the people take a look at that book out there that's hundreds of pages deep. All you do is what the uh, county administrative officer does. I can't get him. We've had eight trees fall last year. This year, eight of them fell, and four houses are gone. Thank, Thank you, you Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who are here in person who would like to speak to us on oral communications? Seeing none, we'll go to online. Please come forward. I, I, I also want to just let you know we did pull the AT&T item, and we'll be speaking to that as item 6.1 on our agenda. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Good morning, Betty Saxon, at and And thank you for pulling it. And I'll be here to assist if there are questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. Hi, Marilyn Garrett. Item 23, your resolution to maintain the landlines. Uh, it's excellent. I request that you send copies to California elected representatives and the governor, as this is a very critical uh, statement. I'd like to talk about COVID shots and quote from um, the winter 2023 editions of Wise Traditions. Uh, this is westinaprice.org um, and it's page nine. And my question prior to reading this is, do we have similar statistics for our county? 
The bad news about COVID shots just keeps accumulating. In the UK, the Office for National Statistics published an update on deaths by vaccination status in England, which revealed that the vaccinated population accounted for 95% of the COVID deaths during the 12 months from June 2022 through May 2023. 94% of those deaths were among either the triple or quadruple vaccinated population, while the unvaccinated accounted for the lowest number of COVID deaths in every single month. ExposeNews.com from November last year. And it's not just COVID that is carrying off the vaccinated. Physicians are describing a surge in aggressive rapid onset cancers following the rollout of the shot in December 2020. Are any other members of the public online? Tim, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, my name is Tim Delaney, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I really appreciate that. Um, I'll just bounce around a number of different topics here. Uh, The family stabilization stuff that I heard from all these folks approaching you, I'm highly supportive of of them. Okay, just want to let you know that. At the last meeting, I heard some comments about, you know, about, you know, there should have been enough public, you know, participation and whatnot. You know, the general public, I'll be honest with you, they really don't have time for this. That's the sad thing here. So, you know, if you're looking for public uh, participation, you know, in anything that you do, it's a little sketch, okay? The general public is trying to survive, all right? So other comment on COVID shots? You know, I want to remind everyone that Santa Cruz County did very well during the epidemic, okay, compared to the rest of the country. And a lot of that does have to do with the vaccination. I'm just fine. I had five shots. You know, my heart rate is 48. Um, I surf and ski, and I'm old. You know, I'm almost 60 here, and good luck trying to ski the Jackson Hole backcountry with me. That's not going to happen, okay? So other comment on Donald Trump, get real folks, a guy that does not like Abraham Lincoln, Eisenhower and Reagan. Are you kidding fellow Republicans? The writing is on the wall. If you are a person of color, you know, and you're going to vote for that guy. Are you that stupid? So those are my comments. Um, The Republican Party really does not exist today. Okay, I'll say a few few more things later on. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. Um, seeing no further speakers, we'll bring it back to the board for action on our consent item, with the exception of item number twenty three that was pulled and moved to the regular uh, agenda. And so, I'll just see if there's any comments from board members, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. On item 32, which is authorizing uh, county departments to phase out gas, gas-powered leaf blowers, um, you know, as the speaker, the, the member of the public mentioned, we've heard a lot of concern about these devices from the public and uh, particularly from Chase, which is well organized and has helped to um, point to a number of different ordinances that have passed in similar jurisdictions. Uh, I've been talking with members of the Santa Cruz City Council about how we could take a regional approach to this. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is a fairly modest first step of just working with count within county departments and then ultimately notifying the public that we're considering this. Um, the fact that there are these rebates available, uh, 72,000 available for homeowners and 290,000 for commercial applicants. Uh, I think that we should make sure we get the word out as quickly as possible so that uh, people can take advantage of those rebates while they're still available um, and uh, have plenty of lead time if, as we consider uh, a larger uh, phase out of these devices within our community. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Thank you. On, on the item that I brought forward regarding uh, uh, support for Senator Padilla's low income household water assistance program, uh, this unfortunately has expired in Congress and the Senator is, is leading an effort to ensure uh, that this uh, 
this water bill and wastewater bill assistance program gets reauthorized, this will provide a pretty essential service as we've seen a pretty significant increase in the costs associated with both wastewater and water rates uh, throughout the country, but in particular in our community. Uh, yeah. For those in, in South County or, or those in general and low income, uh, this is a an important lifeline service. So uh, work with the Senator's office to requesting support from our county officially in order to help push the delegation toward uh, making this a priority. So I appreciate the support of this board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, any comments? Yeah, a couple of things on item uh, 31. I want to thank the Seniors Commission and the county staff for bringing this report on uh, county senior citizens. Uh, as the county is restructuring our commissions, I would like to note that the Seniors Commission is very active and engaged uh, in advocating for senior services, as this report shows. Um, the level of activities and associations that the members of the Seniors Commission are involved is uh, very impressive. Um, we all know that the county's senior population is growing uh, faster at a higher proportional rate than any other segment of our population in the county. Uh, and the attention we uh, make uh, to take care of our seniors and the families and take care of them as who take care of them as well is becoming more critical than ever. Um, the county spends about eighty six and a half million dollars every year for programs directly for the older uh, adults in our community and our county human services department is steering uh, collaborative work to develop a master plan for aging and we're ahead of the game of uh, other counties in the state so it's very impressive so uh, the county has been and will continue to be committed uh, to serving our uh, the well-being of our older adults um, also on 32 I want to thank Supervisor Coney for bringing this uh, phase out of on county properties this is not private uh, I think it's a good first move and I welcome his bringing this to the Board of Supervisors and uh, we'll be supporting it Supervisor Hernandez just a few comments just a few comments on on 32 and 55 as well. Uh, I want to echo uh, Supervisor Koenig's comments about making sure that we get the word out there for the uh, rebates that uh, the Air Board is is having. Um, I think the majority of the commercial users are probably from South County, so it, it's difficult for a lot of people to just purchase new equipment for their entire business. And so I think it's important that we do everything that we can to make sure that business owners. Um, you know, especially in South County, um, get a whole get word of the of this re, of these rebates. And on fifty five, um, I just want to thank uh, CDI for diligently moving this forward. I think it's always important to have uh, safe streets and roads for all. You know, it's I'm excited that we're having this plan. You know, it's really about the engineering of safe roads and education. So, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. I don't have any additional uh, comments, um, so I just want to thank uh, my colleagues for the items that they brought to the attention of the board and to our community and staff for their ongoing work on um, issues that are critical and important to our community. And so with that, I'd like to see if there's um, somebody who'd like to make a motion on consent with the exception of item number 23. I'll move consent agenda. I'll second. One just brief additional comment. I apologize. There was a, a member of the community that asked us to pull an item regarding a our sustainability. I just wanted to note that that's been through, if I, if I calculated correctly, six, eight, or ten at least public hearings, and we've had a lot of public hearings on that at the not just the board, the planning commission, other policy committees within the county, coastal commissions heard it more than once. So, I, I, I and we had a number of community hearings about this, including in the second district. So, I assure you, it's been through a, a very long process of sustainability updates. So, um, I appreciate your interest in the community participation with the communities, what helped shape the document that we're adopting today. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Hernandez, second by Supervisor Friend, to move consent with the exception of item number 23. I'll ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Or Cummings? Sorry. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to our regular agenda. Um, we will start with item number 23 that, was, that is now 6.1 that was pulled from our agenda. Uh, which is the adoption of a resolution requesting that the California Public Utilities Commission deny AT&T's application for release of carry of last resort 
and eligible telecommunications carrier designations and take related actions as recommended by Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor Friend. And since Supervisor Friend pulled this item and put it on the regular agenda, I'd, I'd like to pass it over to him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Supervisor Koenig, well, I'm sure I have additional comments on this. We decided to bring this item forward, not just because there's a significant amount of public interest in this item, but also because there's been a, a, a significant lack of communication uh, from AT&T regarding what the actual plan is uh, and a number of concerned community members, not just in our community, but throughout the state of California. Um, it's my personal belief that uh, that none of the backup systems exist that are adequate yet in order to meet the needs of, of landline, in particular rural landline uh, residents throughout Santa Cruz County. There are residents, though, that, that um, do have secondary systems. There are those that may never actually be able to have an adequate secondary system based on the topography of our area. Um, the reason that I pulled it was because AT&T uh, had graciously agreed to attend today's meeting to speak to the item in order to provide additional context. Um, I'm still uh, think that it's important that this board take up this item today because I think that what's being presented to the CPUC is a binary option of whether or not they are allowed out. Uh, or not, and so I think that that uh, given the fact that that AT and T, in my opinion, isn't isn't ready to provide this sort of uh, backup service for people that need this as a lifeline, that I think it's very important that we can that we express this opinion to the CPC. But um, I'll pass it to Supervisor Koenig, uh, who co-signed this item with me, and I'm going to make sure that we uh, we afford ample opportunity for AT and T to provide opportunity uh, to speak to the community. Supervisor Koenig, thank you, Supervisor Friend. You know, we hear over and over again from the community that communications is the most essential thing during an emergency. And our mountainous region is a very difficult topography to maintain communications. Um, it's self-service doesn't work in a lot of places. Um, internet goes out frequently. And so maintaining our copper telephone line system is essential to make sure that rural residents can uh, get word out and in during these uh, emergency events and disaster events. I mean, I know this firsthand uh, growing up in the Santa Cruz mountains, we'd, whenever the, the power would go out, uh, we'd switch over to the old uh, copper telephone and, uh, you know, just to stay in touch with neighbors uh, as well as with uh, everything else that was going on, even to, you know, call pg &E and report the fact that power lines were down. Um, so I think that We've heard a lot of concern from the community, uh, people who are frankly terrified at the idea of these lines going away, uh, and rightfully so. And, and actually, I'll add, um, I heard from a number of folks who live in Central Live Oak even that said, you know, we're just uh, never felt the need to adopt cell phones, and we still rely on uh, our copper landline as a primary mode of communication. So please, whatever you do, don't take it away. Um, you know, and then I would say we've also seen some of the, um, you know, I'm interested to hear what AT&T has to say um, and what their proposed transition plan is. Uh, I do have concerns, you know, this idea that we'll transition to new people to manage the old network. Um, I mean, we've seen um, folks like Frontier uh, not being particularly good stewards, uh, you know, or just having challenges uh, trying to maintain um, old internet uh, connections. And, um, you know, even Cruise.io, great local internet company, um, ultimately choosing not to provide service um, over the old infrastructure. So I do think that uh, when the people who built the network ultimately uh, leave it, that creates uh, further challenges. So and just to see what at t has to say, but this is just such a vital service for our community. It's hard to imagine how it could uh, ever be phased out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One just additional point. I, I think that, that there's universal recognition that copper lines as a technology are being phased out over time. I, I think that, that's, that, that technology is evolving and that this, this is not uh, the solution for 50 years from now. With that said, in order for it to be phased out and people to have the security that they need of a lifeline service, there needs to be proof that there's an adequate and equal backup service that so far has not been shown to be the case. So I think you can have two things that can be true. One, which is that the application notes that this is a technology that's phasing out. I think that is true. And two, that there's no adequate backup plan for those individuals. So until there is, and there's confidence of this board and I would argue the state and the state CPUC that there should that there is. I, I think that it shouldn't be allowed uh, that the that this application should be allowed. So I think that we can recognize both elements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Are there any other comments from board members before we open up? 
So, uh, so I'll just make a couple comments as well. Um, since joining the Board of Supervisors, um, trying to understand communication issues and solve some of the communication issues in my district has been one of my top priorities. It took us about nine months last year to get in touch with AT&T, but I will say that when we did, um, one thing that was very helpful is that they put us in touch with um, the folks who were in charge of um, reinstalling uh, lines that were lost in the fire. And so right now in White House Canyon, they're reinstalling lines for that community. They're putting in about 120 poles. And so I, I do want to thank AT&T for their you know, follow up on that because folks in that area hadn't had reliable telephone service for about three years. The issue that came up for me, I was hoping to have AT&T come and do a presentation on our regular agenda next meeting to address many of these issues. Um, but, you know, given the Brown Act, we don't necessarily know what we're all working on at the same point in time. Um, but I wanted to have that presentation because what's been confusing for me is that when I've spoken with some folks at AT&T, they've said, we no longer install copper line lines. And then when this came, when this item came forward to the CPUC, um, one of the things that came up in that was that it said that they are required to provide landlines to people, to anyone who wants them. And when I was in touch with the vice president of external affairs, they said, we don't do DSL anymore, but we will still install copper landlines. And I think that's very confusing for the folks who live in my district because many people want traditional landlines, but we're being told and they're being told they, that they can't get that service. And so that's why I was hoping to have this hearing at the next regular meeting so that we can get some clarity on what is the responsibility of AT&T to provide, how do people get access to these services. And so I'm really glad that AT&T is here to help answer some of these questions because for a lot of folks in my district as well, this is one of the only things that they can have in terms of reliable communications and reliable phone service. And uh, people are getting they're, um, very nervous about what could happen if at t were to uh, no longer provide these services. So um, maybe what we'll do is we can start with having the representative from at t maybe speak to some of these issues, um, and then we can open up to the public for public comment. But before that, I'll, I'll go over to the Yeah, it's my first. understanding, uh, and I support what you're, you're, you're going for, um, but this proposal before the PUC is the first part of what might be a three-year process, but I think we're going to hear more about that. So it's not in my understanding, we're going to hear more about it, that they're not going to cut them off next month. It's going to be a process, but we'll hear more about it. So with that, maybe um, we'll turn it over to, I know that there's a representative from AT&T who's here today. If maybe you can come up and speak to some of the issues around um, Air of Last Resort, what types of services that you all actually provide and what people can have access to so that we have some clarity on this. Okay. Good morning, Supervisor Cummings. And all of the other distinguished elected officials representing this county. Uh, first, I'm going to start by saying I'm feeling very ill, but yet this, this item is important to us. So what I'd like for the council to do is to wait until that uh, presentation from my vice president, which she has agreed to with County Council, as well as Supervisor Cummings, to come and answer more thoroughly all of the questions that you may have. I have, in the process, have been meeting with individual supervisors trying to answer some of the questions that constituents may have. We want to disclose and show you exactly what the plan is, where we are, but the only thing I'm here to ask today is to allow us to present on the 27th, which is what was agreed upon with yeah. County Council and Supervisor Cummings, yeah. that I would have the additional reinforcement to assist. Thank you. That's it for now. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item? Well, hello, my name is still James Ewing Whitman. The person, it seems logical that this will be extended to the 27th. I absolutely have no idea what they're going to say, but maybe I can suggest some things that they could say. You know, I would really like to thank all the utility workers that have helped me in the 28 years I've lived in this county. For 12 years, there were three power poles that only served where I lived. And we had trees come down. So I really thank the workers. Now, I wish I could speak on this subject for hours, but it is really important for people to have a hard connection. 
you know, for so many different reasons. Um, granted, the wires could come down and people could lose their ability to communicate. And that's why people should have other ways to communicate. But some things that are not being discussed that I'd like these people to bring up, let's talk about the lobbyist systems in the United States. If you were to look at the amount of money that the lobbyists get for the medical industry or the telecom community industry, you would think with this COVID scam that the medical industry would actually be getting quite a bit more from the lobbyists. But in actuality, the telecommunications agency gets six to eight times as much. So there's a lot of elephants in the room. You know, I should have a piece of paper to give everyone in the public. I like to talk about the dangers of the alternatives. And I do have a piece of paper somewhere where there's a list of 17 different common ailments to different problems with human health. 17 different ailments. And they're all the same for wireless frequencies, the flu, and what is called COVID. So I'm so glad that some other artillery is going to come back and speak on this subject. And once again, I am concerned about the public workers who work with this, some of this dangerous technology. We need to help them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary Richard, I think it was important that uh, Mr. Cummings was uh, concerned about the Brown Act. And uh, that's important. Uh, people should know that if any three of you get together and are talking, that's a violation. And we also have something I'd like the uh, county administrative officer and county council do, is that all of your offices, there's one receptionist, but there's no way to tell who's in there at any one time, at least on the bathroom, you know, there's a light or a knob so or something. Ask, and I think that it item? could be um, followed up by because what's going on behind there, nobody knows, and it's an invitation to break the Brown Act. Thank you. Good morning, David Schwartz. Um, I'm glad you guys took this off the consent agenda and are speaking about it. I think it's very important. Uh, I live in the county um, out in the unincorporated area, and my wife and I have cell phones, and we have we have internet, we have all that stuff. But you know what? Anytime there's a disaster or a, a, a heavy storm, we lose all those forms of communication. So we still have our landline and we're paying AT&T for two landlines to our house. And I have an old phone that actually plugs into the phone network without being plugged into the wall. We keep that just for a backup and we have used it in the past. This is very important and I hope AT&T is listening because if they don't accept this responsibility of being the provider of choice, who's gonna step up? Some of the people that we talked about that you guys have mentioned, they're not as big as AT&T. They can't keep those lines going. They can't keep this active for us. And I foresee in the future that we are going to have more disasters and we are going to have difficulty communicating. Look what happened in Maui. Their biggest problem in Maui was the power went out. They couldn't even pump water to fight the fires. It's a, it's a horrible thing when you have no one thinking about how they're going to keep things going. So AT&T, please do not walk away from your responsibility. This county needs that landline. They need those lines. Keep them going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I also want to thank you for pulling this item from the consent agenda to have better discussion. And I support continuing it until uh, the 27th time so that we have the, the vice president of AT&T here to really um, support um, the woman that that has come here, even though she's feeling very ill. So um, I would like to request to avoid mix-ups like this, that when county council has knowledge, I believe that council can send out notices of such um, important uh, items uh, on on forthcoming agendas so that there are, maybe are not these mix-ups. And I appreciate the respect of the Brown Act here very much. Thank you. I appreciate all of you taking action on this because as a rural resident in the most recent storms, our power went out and um, 
there were there were, are about four of us in this canyon, in the canyon, the Aptos Creek Canyon, that have landlines. We were the only ones that had telephone. Trees went down and blocked the ability of um, AT&T to bring in generators to supply the 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 backup power boxes that they do have in the community. So people were without, except landlines, they were without telephone communication at all. So I also want to add that the existing landlines are very uh, problematic. They're very noisy because the lines have not been maintained. Even though we've paid to maintain them, they have not been maintained. So I would like to suggest that um, AT&T or whichever carry it is considers working with PG&E as PG&E is moving forward to bury their service lines that perhaps unless there is an electromagnetic interference that it would cause that the telecom industry also bury their lines concurrently with this work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public in person who'd like to speak to us at this time? Seeing none, we'll go to online and I, I um, was made aware that the vice president of AT&T's external affairs is on the line as well in case we have any questions. So, um, but I'm not sure if there's a way to identify that person specifically. I, I do have this person um, okay. prepared to speak. Would you like to take the remaining public comment or would you like to? Sure. Let's do public comment first and then let's come back to the VP. Tim, your microphone's now available. Thank you. Thank you so much for hearing me again. Um, just wanted to say that the gentleman before, one of the, you know, earlier on with the foul language that doesn't want to come back and speak anymore, uh, he should keep coming to the meetings. I liked his uh, chicken's comment uh, at the last meeting that we were at. Um, in regards to AT&T, um, this, this is just a corporation. I want to remind everybody of that. Um, you know, a lot of corporations these days are not run by the entrepreneurs and creative minds that that you know came up with all these concepts and uh they did you know they left the, the lead cable in lake tahoe you know so it's in court and it's been going on for years here and uh so that's their uh, fiduciary responsibility okay so i'm not sure what you folks are going to get out of at&t this will be interesting all right so and it's more than just at&t just so you know okay on the summit here a lot of your power can easily be wiped out in the next couple storms. All you have to do, Manu, is just come to my property and take a look. I have a tension line here that's sitting on an AT&T line and Comcast line that holds the, you know, the two poles on my property together so the high voltage lines don't snap. So PG&E here was, you know, they're out here a day or yesterday, you know, working on it a little bit, but they need to come back and finish the job, and I hope they do. So you need to look at my property here because there's a lot going on here with PG&E and AT&T. And if power gets knocked out in the community up here, you know where the problem is. It's right next to my house here. I'm looking right at it. So um, that's my comment, I think, for right now. Oh, one more little thing. Railroads along the coast, all my surfing buddies, every time I mention a rail, they get all angry. We don't like that. Sir, this, this item's about AT&T. So cool. um, I just want to toss that in there. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Take Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett speaking to you on my landline, which is all I have cell phones and wireless technology make me sick from the radiation. And it's interesting when a corporation requests an item be pulled from the agenda, it happens. When a member of the public requests it, it rarely happens. I want to refer people to the, it's online, with the CPUC protest of Nina Beattie to application 23030003. And reading from part of this, Copper Landline is the only appropriate voice and internet service for 
most EMF disabled persons, we need to keep these copper and landlines, quoting from the protest. Throughout its application, AT&T continually talks about voice alternatives, but alternatives must be appropriate, adequate, and equal. Destroying the copper landline system would deprive many AT&T customers of the only service they can use. But far more serious, disabled Californians injured by electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiation who or who have other EMF sensitive medical conditions require and rely on copper landlines for the safest, lowest EMF voice service and which will reliably provide both voice and DSL connection and 9-11 service during disasters and extended power outages. AT&T does you, not mention this. Thank you. We've reached the end of the public comments online and now I'll call on Teddy. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you for uh, giving me a little bit of time this morning to address this item on the agenda. And I appreciate you removing it from the consent agenda so that we can have further dialogue on it. Um, happy to come next week and do a, a broader presentation, but I would like to just address a couple of the highlights today. Um, there, the AT&T's copper network is coming to the end of its life cycle and and it will soon become um, obsolete. It's very difficult to get parts to maintain and installers um, to train and to dispatch to areas. Um, I completely understand that we're not there yet. The notices that went out from the PUC included copper customers and VoIP customers. And VoIP is the voice over internet protocol. So when you look at the map that came with that notice, and I don't know how many of you have seen that. Um, I would like to be showing it to you right now. But there is blue on the map and there is purple on the map. And the blue areas of California are representative of where there are alternative providers today based on the CPUC information off of their website. The purple on the map indicates that there is no alternative provider today. And much of Santa Cruz County is purple. This isn't even going to pertain to many, 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 many of the residents who I'm sure are speaking there today and others that aren't, but are concerned that their landline is going away. So. I put that out there to say that as I look across the entire state of where we are seeking polar relief, Santa Cruz and the North Coast have the biggest, biggest pockets of purple, where there are no alternative providers. And where there are no alternative providers, we are not able to be released of our polar obligation, plain and simple. Until there is an alternate provider, we will remain the carrier of last resort. So I think it will become clear, you know, when we're there and we can talk about the maps and we can look at zones and we can look at districts. Um, but much of Santa Cruz County is purple. So we know that there are not a lot of alternatives and that people rely on their landline phones. Um, I've done an immense amount of work with Betty over 27 years in Davenport and um, Ben Lohman. I mean, we, 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 we understand the issues. I don't live them every day, but I certainly understand the connection that people have and um, the affinity that people have come to rely on their landline phones. And I totally get it. The problem with that is that that network is going away eventually. It's not going away tomorrow. It's not going away in two years from now. It's not going away in 10 years from now. It is going to be a phase out. And this application process at the PUC 
is going to establish the rules under which we may be released from that COLAR obligation. It may come with a timeline. It may come with a commitment. It may come with something. Nobody has asked for COLAR relief before in California because we've only been the COLAR forever. So this is all new, this process. And, and with change, I understand um, people are worried that, you know, they may only have a landline connection into their home. And we know the fires, the floods, the earthquakes. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's all here and understand that people need their landline phones and they want that connection. So part of this noticing, um, the VoIP customers are not impacted by this. Those, uh, the voice over internet protocol customers will remain, um, they're not even a part of this, but we were required to include them in the notice. So um, we have a we have admittedly a lot of work to do. We need to we need to get out. We need to meet with people. We need to answer questions. Um, I think a lot of the map is um, again it's pretty telling by zip code. It's on the CPUC website. Um, it's on the, the um, address is on the notice. I'm happy to provide it um, for folks if they would like it. So that is really just what I want to open with. Um, this, we have, and many others, as you know, the California under SB 156 is, um, has put, the governor has put $6 billion towards building out broadband to Californians to bridge a digital divide with additional approximate 3 billion for bead funding that's coming. We have submitted applications for Santa Cruz County, uh, 22 million to hit 14,000 living units to bring fiber. Uh, I know that other companies have as well for Santa Cruz County. And I know that the PUC is working through those applications currently. So technology is going to change as we begin to roll through this timeline, whatever the timeline is determined by the CPUC in this proceeding. So I, I really want, um, I really want to impress that, that this isn't going to be a decision that's made, you know, in two months, six months, 10 months, and then we're going to just flip a switch. Um, again, if, if you're in a purple zone and you have no alternatives, we have to keep our COLAR obligation. And then we're going to work on a phased in approach that I'm sure will be somehow required mandated by this process at the PUC as we work through what's going to happen. Um, so I'm going to take a pause there and see if you have any questions. Thank you so much. I'd like to see if there's any board members that may have any questions, Supervisor Friend. Yeah, thank you. And also, I know we also have our ISD director and our director of OR3 who have expressed concerns on this that are here that may want to speak to this as well. But first, let me uh, express some gratitude for you taking the time to communicate because uh, there's been no communication. There was no outreach to the county. There was no outreach to elected officials. There was no outreach to the community other than the letter. Um, and I think one of the troubles that we have here, and I'm still standing behind of uh, this board taking action today in this way is that what I hear you saying on the maps does have a, you just need to trust us that it's gonna work out feeling to it. And there is no guarantee that this is gonna work out for residents that have no other option. So because there's no timelines spent, and well, the timeline in your application, which I understand that you're sort of disputing us is six months. Um, so what I would ask you is, will there be specific requests from AT&T before the CPUC to say that you want a longer phase in period, that you want guarantees of communication with local governments, that you want some element of ways that you can ensure that these residents know that until they have an adequate backup, this won't happen. And two, that you won't actually so uninvest in what they currently have that it becomes pointless for them to even have copper anyway, which um, strikes me as one of the things that's happening right now. Do you have thoughts on those? 
Sure. So um, the map that I'm referring to is on the CPUC website. So it's not a trust me AT and T website. It's it's on that. It's it's the CPUC website, and so um, you can you can get to that. You can see it. Um, the 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 purple section is where in our application we have designated there are no alternatives. And if there are no alternatives, by definition, we cannot have Kohler relief, number one. And um, number two, we have outreach to many of our nonprofit partners across the state. Um, could we have done better? Absolutely. Did, did, did we not do enough? Absolutely. I'm not sure we could ever do enough. This is a, this is a, situation where people received a notice, they looked at the six months and said, oh, my landline's going away in six months. Um, so I, I take your um, your comment about working with the PUC and establishing um, a, that timeline. And again, that timeline will be worked out in this proceeding. Um, I think you made the comment earlier about alternative um, viable alternatives that will also get worked out um, in this proceeding and where there are no viable alternatives, then we will not be able to be relieved of our Kohler obligation. But I will tell you that there are manufacturers that are no longer making parts for this network. And that is one of the critical reasons why we stopped serving DSL. We were buying DSL parts on eBay and I am not, I'm not lying. It, it, it sounds stupid and ridiculous, but the fact of the matter is we have manufacturers that are no longer producing parts for this network and it is eventually going to go away. And we would like to be prudent and transparent in how we do this transition. We haven't done COLA before. Like I said, this is the first time anybody's at seeking COLA relief in California. So, you know, the PUC is going to have evidentiary hearings starting, I believe, next month. Um, and um, that's when, you know, we present evidence, the opposition presents evidence, um, interveners to the proceeding. Um, so it is going to be a process. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's where we're at right now. We are, it, go ahead, sorry. No, um, were you finished with your comments? I am, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have some staff here who may be able to also speak on this item. I do before um, we move forward, I did, didn't want to just check with the board to see. Um, Part of why we were trying to set up a, a formal presentation was to be able to have more public involvement, let, make sure the public knew about this meeting so that they could come and comment and speak about their experiences so that AT&T could present some of these maps and the different options to us. Um, and so I feel like we can continue to have that conversation today, but if there's interest in potentially continuing this item so we could have AT&T be able to make a formal presentation, it might also help the community to be able to participate in this because to supervise a friend's point, I don't think a lot of members of the community were aware that we were going to have this in-depth of a discussion on this item today. And by having a presentation, I feel like people can come in and speak directly to A&T and T about their experiences because um, that I think is going to be really helpful for us to understand our position, for them to understand what's happening in the community and um, for us to really be able to have um, a more robust discussion on this. And so uh, we, I was just thinking in the interest of time, if there's an, if there's a desire to continue this and have a formal presentation with AT&T, we could probably just continue this conversation to the next meeting and then we can move on with the rest of the agenda. Um, but just wanted to check to see how, how people felt about that. I'm so comfortable. With, I mean, at the end of the day, this is my position on this issue because we're hearing a lot of stuff from AT&T that isn't that I can't cross-reference and I can't verify. There's a binary choice between the CPUC. I think it's important for the board to take a, take this position. So I'm, I'm comfortable voting on this today and still bringing them back to have them answer additional questions. But at the end of the day, I didn't mean that it was a trust us 
about the maps. It's a trust us that all these things will end up happening and the timelines will end up happening because the only person dictating that is AT&T right now, right? So I think that this is where we have the say. This is where the county has the say in staying to the CPUC. And by the way, the timeline's a, a little compacted. I think it's important for us to get these comments in sooner than later to have an impact uh, with CPUC. Any other board members want to speak? Uh, you know, I, I'd prefer to have a more in-depth presentation with the charts that they're referring to. And for also, uh, you know, we had a significant amount of emails uh, from constituents and a couple of them were from South County. Um, I, I know they're not in the purple, but uh, it'd be a good chance for them to either call in or watch watch the uh, presentation as well. Uh, and for all of us to just make a more informed decision about it. So I'd be willing to wait on this issue. I could too. I, I think uh, my mind's made up. It's it's too bad that um, more facts and uh, certainly there's no guarantees. So that's really, and I don't know if they can come up with a guarantee of any type in two weeks. So I'm not sure where I can be changed um, for what I'm thinking about this. I'd like to hear from our own staff members in regard to this for sure. Um, I could go along with uh, going to, waiting for another two weeks, but um, Boy, I, I, I don't know. I it, this was not well presented uh, in advance. I mean, when you see the the really, it's the uh, North County area and Bonnie Dune is where there's wouldn't be any uh, uh, carrier of last resort. They would keep their lines, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I would I could go along with waiting, but uh, I'm not going to leave them, my my constituents out there high and dry without any guarantees. Supervisor County, do you have any? Comments or yeah, we'll try to come to staff. Your mic's off. Can you hear me? There we go. Um, just briefly, I think it goes without saying that OR3 and ISD are deeply engaged in this process. I do want in the effort to be transparent and clear in the diagram that was shared um, and, and that some of you have to make clear on the statement that was made by AT&T digitally. Um, there are approximately 1,249 residents that are in the purple area on the AT&T maps that are on the CPUC website. So it is not accurate to say that a majority of our residents, especially those most vulnerable in our rural high fire zones, are not impacted by the proposed actions. So we welcome further conversation in two weeks and happy to engage at the ISD and OR3 level, but wanted to make that clear um, since information has a way of getting away from us. Tammy Weigel, I'm the director of ISD. So um, I'm very concerned about this um, issue um, again, which is why um, we did bring it to the attention of uh, Supervisor Friend's office. Um, and I share the, the concerns. Um, one of the roles I have in the county is that when um, residents and constituents get to go to their um, supervisor's office, when they don't have broadband, when they don't have phone service, and we saw a real significant uptick in this in the last storms. We had residents who were without power for over almost five days. And so some of them did not get their Comcast, which is where they're basically getting their voice over IP phone service restored until then. So it is a real concern, and I am concerned about, you know, what the timeline is for AT&T to provide alternative service, because right now, as we all know, the um, Comcast and um, Spectrum are dependent upon power. Um, Verizon and AT&T's uh, cellular service is, and also, too, while we have coverage within our county, our capacity for uh, cellular service has definitely been exceeded. So we do have some serious issues, even if someone has a cellular service within their community up in the mountains and has is able to get a call out, there's no chance it's going to go through during an emergency because of the uptick in cellular. So again, I really support the board going forward with this. Um, we have concerns and we really would like to see a significant plan on how there's going to be a, repla a reliable replacement project. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I would propose that we move forward today with this action and then we also have a non-action item hearing. I mean, not hearing, but presentation from at t that we can make time certain at the next meeting so the community is aware of it. And it's really just a listening session because they haven't really done the outreach. But, I, but from a positional standpoint, 
I, I'm, the board is, this is where I think the board is. I think that all five of us are here. And so I think we should send this item forward to the CPUC. I, I like the recommendation of Ms. Garrett that we add on our, our delegation, which was not part of the recommended actions, just so they're aware of it. Um, I know that'll surprise Ms. Garrett that I'm agreeing with her on something, but I think it's good <laughs> after 12 years that she feels that way. So, but all the same, um, I, I'm prepared to move this forward today um, and then still have that, that additional presentation in a couple of weeks. So I'll, I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction that we write that direct the chair to write uh, this position to our, our delegation, our state delegation. Second. A motion by Supervisor Friend, a second by Supervisor Koenig. Are there any other further comments from board members on this item? Seeing none, I, I, I will say that um, I can kind of go either way on this one um, because I don't think my position is going to necessarily change. I do think that it's important that we still continue to have this meeting with AT and T, have this presentation. Um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle here, and I know that uh, AT and T really wanted to speak to us before we took action. Um, but it's challenging, you know, we can't all talk to each other about how we're trying to, um, you know, bring these items forward. So, the DC is going to have its. They're going to cut this through. Oh, your mic. You don't say it. The PUC is going to have its discussion. So if we don't let them know where we are at right now, at least, um, I think we're really uh, shunning our duties. I did have one question for the, um, the, the VP of External Affairs who's on the line. So my district encompasses the majority of that kind of purple zone where we're supposed to be provided, you know, the carrier of last resort, even if this does, this application does go through. But one of the, the problems that we've, the residents there have had is that, and I'm kind of basing this on what I've seen on the CPUC's website, is that if somebody calls in and wants a landline, they're supposed to get it. People have been reaching out to me since I've been on the board and have been asking why they can't have a landline and that they're told by AT&T they can't have a landline. And so I'd just like to get some clarity on whether or not if someone calls in and wants to get a, a copper landline, if that's something that AT&T is required to provide. AT&T is required to provide basic service. And however the technology, whether a copper landline or a VoIP line, as long as they provide basic service, it's technology neutral. So it doesn't it doesn't say it has to be a copper line. It says it has to be a line that provides basic service. So whether it comes over fiber or whether it comes over copper is up to the carrier, is up to AT&T uh, to install. But anybody who is calling to request basic service will get basic service from AT&T. And if you have anybody who that is not the case, I will give you my cell phone number and they can call me personally because that is, that is, that's not happening. Thank you very much. And then I just wanted to chair, I, I'm sorry, I think that the uh, vice president said the evidence you're hearing for the PUC, PUC is March 24th. I think it's next month, not this month. I stand corrected. So, so there's a series of public participation hearings happening right now um, across the state. But the the proceeding will begin evidentiary hearing, I believe, at the end of sometime in March or April. Um, I, I'd have to double check that. I don't follow the legal calendar as closely. Um, but um, the next step in this uh, process is to begin evidentiary proceedings after the conclusion of the public participation hearings across the state. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. So if we do have that extra time, I, you know, like I said, I'm fine, you know, hearing this on the 20, 27th, is it, that you said? Um, sure. If we have, you know, the CPUC meeting till March 24th, that still gives us time to put a letter in uh, after we hear the full presentation. Yeah. Yep. Um, given that, uh, I think we've heard all the comment on the board. Um, we'll go ahead with a roll call vote on this item. And um, and my hope is that regardless of the outcome, at and will be willing to come back and speak to the community because I think there's still a desire from members of our community to have a further presentation and more information on this item. Um, 
I, I really like would like to have the community have an opportunity to hear directly from AT and T. And I know that today um, the presentation was there was enough time to pull a presentation together at the last minute. Um, and so I, I do think that there's a, a value and a benefit so people understand what's happening. But it does appear that um, there are board members who um, feel really concerned about this and, and strongly about their position. And so um, we're going to continue to move forward with the vote today. And so with that, I'll turn it over to the clerk uh, for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? No. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. That passes with uh, Supervisors Koenig, Friend, McPherson, Cummings voting in favor, and Hernandez voting against. And so we'll have that come back. Uh, we'll have a presentation come back on the 27th. Um, and um, hopefully we can get a lot of community questions answered at that time. So the next item on our agenda is item number seven, which is uh, the consider the general fund mid-year budget report with updates and estimates for fiscal year 2023-24 and an updated general fund forecast schedule a public hearing on May 14th, 2024 at 9 a.m. or thereafter to consider the issuance of lease revenue bonds by the Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority schedule public hearings for the proposal fiscal year 2024-25 budget beginning on April 9th, 2024, continue to May 21st, 2024, and May 22nd, 2024, and concluding on June 4th, 2024, scheduled at June 4th, 2024 as the date to consider amendments to the county's United Fee schedule and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marcus Pimentel uh, to kick off the staff report. Uh, good morning and thank you, Chair Cummings and Board of Supervisors. I am Marcus Pimentel, your County Budget Manager. Um, on behalf of the County Administrator Officer, Carlos Palacios, all the department heads and the staff in the CEO's office, I thank you for this opportunity to provide you an overview of where we're at in this current fiscal year and an updated longer-term forecast for the general fund. Um, this year's uh, annual report is impacted by several things, including this, the recently published state budget with a $37.9 billion state deficit uh, that was proposing to have some impacts on our county, but more importantly, color, colored by the seven federally declared disasters that have occurred since 2017 that have impacted our county. That's forced us to pay up front $250 million in costs, and we're waiting on nearly $150 million in, in, in unreimbursed costs. Um, that's that's some of the biggest factors. And then layering on top of that, you'll hear a little bit more, just the, the new mandated service levels that we have to provide as an extension of federal and state government that are increasing our costs in the out year and throughout the most most of our forecast. So I'll dive a little bit deeper into that. In the end, this is a, an, a report. Um, it sets the stage as the bridge and reporting between uh, today, February 13th, and the release of our proposed budget on April 2nd. We'll have the first of our public hearings on April 9th. They'll continue um, in May and conclude on June 4th. So with that, You've seen these slides before, but it bears repeating, and we, we recognize that um, a lot of members of our public still are better informed, but there's a lot more we can do to make sure people understand the uniqueness that uh, all counties, in particular this county, plays across government services in our region. Um, most of our county is an extension of the federal and state government where we have mandated services we must do. Then we have local mandated services that we're providing to our direct residents in the unincorporated area. And a third layer is we're delivering services to people in cities, such as our libraries, our uh, public defender, um, road, uh, road maintenance across most of the county, uh, garbage, water. Uh, so we, we're, we're a complex animal. We provide direct federal services, we provide services as a municipality to the greater unincorporated area, and then we provide services to people who live in cities. Uh, we, in essence, are the biggest city in the county, and again, we've talked about this before. Another thing that bears repeating is just our funded level. We are systematically underfunded. This chart uh, has us in the bottom right quadrant. Uh, most folks who look in those, you've seen four sector quadrants before, you never wanna be in the bottom right. Um, middle's nice. Um, over to the left is better, uh, left up is always good. Um, in this case, where we, as a percent of population served, half the county is unincorporated, so we have direct services to half the county. That's atypical. Uh, typically, 20% might be normal, more normal. And then our, we've talked about our funding levels, uh, whether it's sales tax that's being distributed 
paid locally and going to other other counties are property tax that for a lot of reasons taking back to prop 13 we have much smaller allocations uh, uh, uh one tenth of what our peer uh, counties have, and about a third of what our all counties have across the state. So we're severely underfunded in many ways. Um, factors that are impacting our area that this was covered in a, in a slide um, late last year regarding Measure K, but it still bears repeating that while we are in probably one of the world's most beautiful locations, we're in a very attractive place to live. Uh, housing is a challenge for us. We have a shortage of homes for many of our families, our frontline service workers. Um, and the cost of housing, as we well know, is, is a challenge. Uh, it takes a, a, a person in this area to earn $63 an hour to find an apartment for, to live. So we just have a lot of challenges in inventory and the cost of living that, that puts pressure on all of us. Um, in addition, the theme of climate-based disasters um, adds additional emphasis on us. Again, $250 million that we've, we've paid out in disasters since 2017. Um, as compared to our general total tax revenue base, that far exceeds our tax revenue base of $210 million. So um, we, we are just not funded well enough to respond to both um, the need for finding more services and housing, as well as the need to pay up front and wait years, years, and years for federal reimbursement. And as a, a another data point, um, we are we are tasked with a, a greater need to uh, severely increase our a share of housing across our area. So this slide is uh, the, the allocation of the regional housing needs that was recently released. Uh, the county has the biggest uh, biggest need and and the biggest obligation to find new homes across our our, our unincorporated area. So moving on to things that we've done well, again, taking a moment to recognize despite our challenges, despite our, our staff responding to disasters everywhere, despite this board being challenged um, almost weekly with, with new things, including the recent issues that you were just discussing, um, we still find a way to keep moving forward and, and make making amazing comp accomplishments across our community. Um, and you know, something near and dear to me is this county stepped forward and was a leading player in saving the Watson Community Hospital, uh, bringing $5.5 million in funding and uncountless resources by many people in this room who, without that, that hospital would not be here, serving 33,000 people in the ER uh, annually. Um, we partnered with to build housing on the 7th and Capitola Avenue. Um, that's a combination of uh, medical delivery and housing needs. Uh, we've purchased the Westbridge building that I'll talk a little bit more about. We've certainly were instrumental in leading the federal government to find a way to recalculate their formulas for federal funding for the power river levy um, these are just one of many 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 examples um, and i don't want to bypass the libraries that we we took the lead on um, funding and building a new libraries just recently we opening the aptos library um, if we're not for an atmospheric river we'd have a lot more fun on that grand opening day so just re it bears repeating a couple of our um Big accomplishments, the South County Service Center, which is equity, providing services, it's climate-based, we're reducing traffic miles. There's a lot of great things coming out of this asset that's coming online this calendar year. Uh, we hope by the summer, or we're expecting by the summer. Um, not only bringing services to our county, but allowing uh, staff to reduce their commute times and be closer to where they live. It's, it's a win-win-win, providing a lot more services to, uh, to others across the entire county. And more importantly, the recently acquired and, and uh, under construction children's crisis of residential program stabilization unit. Um, we've talked a lot about this. This is adding the 15th. There's only 14 other units like this across the state. The 15th will be here in the county. And it's a great asset for so many members of our county and children and alike who, who just need these services. So it's, again, these are really unique accomplishments that I think others in our place wouldn't even try to, to do, and yet we keep pushing pushing that envelope. Um, and it certainly bears repeating our investment and step up in our response for uh, Office of Response Recovery and Resilience in their efforts with disaster recovery, resiliency. This entire county is, is typically deployed during a disaster event. Uh, public Works is on the front lines of repairing roads. You have public safety out, out there keeping people safe. Um, and not just getting ready to respond for a disaster, we're planning ahead with how do we adapt to future disasters? How do we become a more resilient community with all of our infrastructure? So this county is doing a lot of great things to keep moving us forward. Um, despite that, we have we have our challenges and 
you know, occasionally we'll go out and, and get a sense of the public you know, where they're at and what their biggest concerns are. And this, this slide represents six of those biggest concerns, whether it's our need to provide wildfire, flood, and emergency response. This is just current top of mind with all of our disasters we're doing. But repairing streets and potholes is always there. But I, I want to give you a little factoid that's interesting. We, we have 607 miles of roadway that we're responsible for, typically two lanes um, times that by two. That's 1,200 miles, just a little over 1,200 miles. That's from here to Denver, Colorado. We're effectively being asked to pave and maintain and invest in roadways from here to Denver, Colorado. And that's just a magnitude. Again, going back to our setup, most counties don't have that. And if they do, they have a much deeper, richer uh, property tax base uh, to fund that from. Um, I want to pause a little bit and just, this is a lot of data slide. And it's typically something I wouldn't have gone um, as to present, but I just want to talk about going into the development of our forecast. Uh, we've put a lot of energy into improving the accuracy, uh, extending the, the forecast from two to five to now a seven year forecast. And there's a lot of data points that come into to developing this forecast. Our own data points on what we do on our, our trends, seven year, five year, three year trends, uh, backing up things that happened during COVID because they're, they're one time factors, but also looking regionally and nationally and what's going on in other trends that impact us. So here's just an example of various data points and key data points that we're tracking. Um, one is uh, CalPERS rate of return and CalPERS is you know, manages all of the, uh, the investment proceeds, all the proceeds that are held um, for paying future retirees across the state from all the member agencies. Um, this factor impacts us in that when, when the investment portfolio is doing well, um, our costs stabilize or actually can go down. Um, the recent trend over the last several decades, going back to the Great Recession, is um, CalPERS has had more often losses than, than gains. And when they have gains, they're not reaching their target, whether that's the current 6.8% target. The last two years average, they've lost 0.15%. Uh, so instead of earning 6.8% in the last two years, they've actually lost ground of 0.15% in their investment portfolio. And that impacts us because that's effectively our portfolio being being shrunken, which increased our costs in the out years. Typically it's a two or three year fiscal year lag, but it's an important indicator for us to track to understand where our future costs are gonna be. And what, what we know is we're gonna have some future um, payments to make, make up for these investment losses. Um, from a jobs perspective, uh, while we have seen payroll jobs in our county decrease and unemployment go up. We're still in a reasonably okay place. Um, those, those areas are yellow. They're not a place that we're, we're, we're alarmed with yet, but they're just tracking. Um, certainly if we keep losing payroll jobs, it's an amount of jobs that are available. Um, that's a concern to us. Uh, unemployment, we tend to be in around a five or six percent rate given so much of our uh, rural nature and the demographics of our community. Um, a factor that is impacting we're concerned about because of consumer spending. Consumer spending drives the economy. Two-thirds of consumer spending makes up our GDP. Consumer spending drives our sales tax revenue and to a certain extent TOT revenue. So we, we, we are really concerned about what's happening in the consumer's uh, place. Um, and we've seen, as you all know, we've tracked over the last year, mortgage rates go up from about 3% at this point last year. Now it's about 6.62%. Um, and it's likely they're going to stay in those 6% rates for the next year. So that just increases uh, price points for, for, for consumers, reduces their flexibility with moving, reduces their flexibility with taking on equity lines. Um, it's just, it's a factor that we know will reduce the ability for consumers to spend. Um, another factor um, to the positive is retail sales keep going along. Uh, despite that high infl inflation rates that we've seen last year, despite high mortgage rates, despite our um, rates for, for car loans, uh, consumers continue to spend. Um, will that sustain itself? We, we think it'll moderate. Um, we don't think it'll decline, but there are some factors to be concerned about. Most importantly, what we talked about last year, uh, the percent of savings that consumers have across the nation as, as reflected in their disposable income. Um, consumers last year had about a 3.2% of their, um, at their, of their savings rate. Now it's 4%, a slight increase up, but that's still just two weeks. Two weeks of their paycheck is in representative of the savings. So consumers have been shrinking down their savings rates and that's a, a, a decline over the decade. So that's just a factor we continue to watch. Um, we know at some point in time, low savings rates, high, uh, if unemployment goes up, um, eventually there'll be some pressures on retail sales to, to impact. Again, I just wanna talk about other external factors that go into our forecast, not just what we, what we see and feel here locally.
So what is in our forecast? Uh, we went out to 23, uh, 31, fiscal year 20, 2030, 31, excuse me, and extended our forecast out with credible expectations for revenue growth, but also what we know to be cost growth. And what we're seeing is uh, a period of time where uh, this year we look to be effectively balanced. We're about a half a million short right now in the model based on early estimated actuals. We'll get a new batch of departmental estimated actuals in these coming weeks, and we'll revise this, this trend line uh, with the release of our proposed budget. Um, but our out years, and I'll talk about that in, in the next slide, driven by the need for disaster financing, driven by the need for new state mandated service levels, uh, driven by the need to increase and start regular investments across our aging facilities. We were, having, we're just exposing ourselves to higher deficits in our out years. Um, those deficits uh, peak in around 26, 27 at 35 million, and then start a, a gradual decline by uh, 20, 30, 31, dropping to about 15 million. So this is, we're, we're kind of in a, a negative uh, 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 arc period where we're gonna, our deficits will peak in a couple of years and then they'll start lessening. And so by the time we get about uh, 20, 30, 31, they'll be in a place where we think we can effectively manage them. Now, as a percent of the general fund, we're still under 5% even at the high point. So as a percent of our entire general fund, um, when deficits are less than 5%, it still gives us a lot of options to try to bridge, the, bridge that. And that's how, if you look back or historically, we've been able to balance the years and finish the years uh, close to our, our projections um, are, are effectively um, in a good spot. So we'll, we'll just have more work to do, more work with this board in the coming budget season and more work with staff to figure out how do we how do we still absorb these cost increases by keeping um, uh, with static revenues, but keeping our service levels intact? It's just a delicate balance. This next slide, and this was discussed in more detail in our mid-year uh, annual report in the board packet. This next slide focuses on that that deficit number. So if you go back to that slide and where we were projecting our deficits. 21.6 million projected next year if we do nothing. If we just let it happen, we'd have a $21 million deficit next year. Now that you know, this budget development cycle, we're gonna do everything we can to get that in balance. Um, but this, this slide kind of shows what are the drivers of that deficit number? And what you can see here is disaster financing, new state mandates, and stepping up increases in our in our facilities. These are all increased cost pressures uh, across us, not ongoing operations. We have increased cost pressures that are coming online in these next couple of years. Um, disaster financing, we're looking at nearly about $7 million annually we're gonna be paying in debt, interest, and principal. Um, that is just to finance a portion of our 2017 storm response, uh, portions of our CZU fire response, and a, a smaller portion of our 2023 storm response. That's financing work already done or just about complete, but not future work that we're still struggling with. We have order of magnitude of 60 or $70 million of future repair work for the 2023 storms alone that we don't have a solution for. Um, so this is financing work we've already done, but those bridges, those roadways, those culverts that are still um, gonna be a problem, a, a lot of that we don't have a funding solution yet, even by issuing new debt. So we'll talk about that in more detail at our May 14th uh, public hearing. Um, new state mandates, these are largely in the space of uh, care courts, increased need to provide uh, more and, and higher levels of healthcare services for those in our probation or de uh, detention jail systems, um, CalAIM and some potential state budget cuts. These are, these are a factor of some new costs that we're seeing come on board in this, in this next year, things we must do. Again, as an, a delivery provider, an extension of the federal and state government, we have mandates we must deliver. And often with the state of California, they'll put new mandates. We have to increase our costs, but there's no funding behind those mandates, even though they're required to provide funding for mandated services. So that's another area of advocacy that we're gonna continue to work on. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the key drivers in, in those deficits. Um, we've, we've done the work, we know where they're coming from, and we have a high credibility that these numbers are real. Um, but the other side of our cost factor is what's happening on revenue growth. Um, and the whole point of this slide is we are projecting pretty credible and realistic revenue growth. You know, if you look at our property tax, we're not just banking 3% every year. We have modeled that models outputs that are based on our seven years of, of historical um, uh, 
actions, as well as data we're getting locally from either our assessor's office um, or auto controller's office or in the region. Uh, so we're factoring in growth in property tax uh, for four and a quarter, upwards of six, six and a half percent. Um, VLF is, is vehicle license fees, I'm sorry. VLF uh, vehicle license fees back in 2003. Um, we used to receive that directly and now we receive that through the property tax payments. We're also projecting that to grow up, to grow up, to grow uh, continuously four to 6% range. Sales tax a little bit narrow for growth margin, three and a half percent up to about five and a half percent over the coming years. Um, TOTs continues to be uh, a, a strong uh, revenue stream for us. We see continued interest for people who want to come here. Um, and with our new rates that came on board in the last year, we're going to see a greater share of TOT growth in our out years. And what we talked about last year, um, we have a couple new taxes, cannabis tax, not new, but been around for a while. The newness is it, it drops in half and it's kind of plateaued at about $3 million a year. Our cup tax that we thought we'd have more revenue gain from to be invest in and in, in, in impacts of single-use disposable cups. That's still around the two hundred eighty, three hundred thousand number that hasn't changed a whole lot. And one area I wanted to... to Focus on. We've talked last year a little bit uh, during the budget season, or a lot of it, about the property tax allocation and how we're getting 13.4 cents on the dollar, and the you know state average is 19 cents. I'll, I'll still talk about that, but I really want to focus on online sales. So, as more and more consumers are moving to online sales and away from brick and mortar, our local retailers, um, that's just a, a nature of it. There's a couple issues with online sales, though. Um, online sales. When somebody in the unincorporated area is buying from their home or buying at their business and they live in the unincorporated, they're paying a sales tax. So a resident in the unincorporated area or business in the unincorporated area is paying a sales tax to their online retailer. That sales tax either gets distributed and shared amongst cities in this county. It doesn't stay in the unincorporated area. And that drops our rate from 19 cents down to 5 cents. Or it leaves this county entirely and goes to another county where the fulfillment center is located. So that's a challenge in, in online sales tax. Again, it's really both boistered up the entire U.S. retail economy, um, but the distribution of sales tax hasn't caught up to the uh, the modern way in which people are, are, are purchasing things. So we're losing about $5 million a year in general fund taxes from this formula where you buy it online in the unincorporated county, and that sales tax either goes to other cities in our area or goes to other counties across the, the state. Um, so that's a challenge for us. That's that's in the code and in state uh, administrative regulations. But we feel that there's some there's some opportunity to address some of these areas. Um, one thing I should have noted in sales tax on the prior slide with our growth in sales tax that does not include anything in the projected uh, measure K that's on the ballot in March 5th. We're not projecting there's estimated about $10 million annually. That's not included in our forecast. Um, the nice thing about locally voted upon district taxes like Measure K is that solves for some of the problem. Um, so it, it solves for when an online purchase happens, most of the time that purchase will stay in this area because of the distribution rules are different from the state rate and the uh, locally voter approved. That's an example of why do we, are there two allocation methods? You know, let's, let's fix one that makes the most sense. Um, but the, that's the nice thing about our, our current half cent sales tax and any new half cent sales taxes that we're looking at. If they do come online, we get we get to keep more of that revenue and protect it and keep it local. We've talked uh, again a lot about the property tax allocation. Uh, the state average is uh, counties across the state at 19.3 cents. Our county is 13.4 cents. What that means is about 36 million less in property tax allocation that we get as if if we were at the state average level. That's 36 million more we'd have for. Um, all of our services to deal with our roadways and everything. So that's just a putting it over magnitude of what the impact is for us. And moving into the home stretch, um, just a, a snapshot of our reserves. Our reserves are at a good point. Um, they, they were closer to 7% years ago, and we brought them up to 10%. Um, so that's a strong number. And we, we're going to do everything we can to keep that in place. Um, just as a one thing to note about our reserves within our reserves, um, so several of it is committed and assigned balances. Um, there's some of it, about half of it is can, can be used for healthcare delivery services or investments in healthcare. So if we were to back that out and, and use all those health funds, we would, we would drop our reserves to about 5% or about two and a half payroll cycles. We're not doing that. Um, and despite that we have some of this held up in our reserves, 
uh, we're still able to do things like the use the Children's Crisis Center and expansion services for for health and in our Medicaid population. So, just a, again, this is good news. Our reserves are at ten percent. We plan to keep them there. As a snapshot of where we're at in our budget cycle, today's February 13th, major report. This is a bridge to what's to come next. Uh, April 2nd, the proposed budget will be released online, and then on April 9th, we'll be presenting it to this board. Uh, budget hearings start May 21st, 22nd, and conclude on June 4th, moving into year and in, year and work that brings the adopted budget on September 24th. But just finishing on an area that is to come next. Um, and I forgot to mention, we have our, our, our municipal advisor, Suzanne Harrell with Harrell Associates. I believe she's on the line. And so if there are any questions regarding our, our debt financing that we're gonna be bringing to the board on May 14th, she's available for questions. But um, we know we have to finance um, some of our, our disaster debt. Uh, the roads, we, in order to finish the projects that are already out there for still some 2017 projects, uh, CZU project, as well as uh, several, several uh, 2023 projects, just to finish the ones we've already committed to doing, it's going to take about 85 million at least in new new funding that we don't have. So we're going to go to the debt market um, with a combination of some internal loans, a lot of uh, debt market loans, upwards of about $85 million. That number is still in refinement, but that looks like to be our maximum number. Um, and we'll be coming back May 14th. That's one of the actions we're doing today. So over the next couple of months, we'll be fine tuning that. This is going to be a complicated financing with several internal loans. Um, some variable variable rate debt and long-term debt, 20, 30 year debt. There'll be a combination of things, recognizing that we're in a high, high interest rate market, recognizing that we have made progress with FEMA reimbursements over the last, since November, actually, uh, 15 and a half million of new obligations have come in, been done by the federal government. The unfortunate equation of that is the state's run out of cash. So now the state can't execute those payments. Typically we'd see payments in 60 to 90 days, but some of that will be held at least until September of 2024 because the state is having their own cash uh, challenges. So while it's been good work and we've done some incredible advocacy by this board, uh, by Supervisor Friend, his office, Chief of Staff Allison, Violante, and many, many members of this county team, we've done some incredible advocacy to get COVID focused on and get a lot of our claims up. We've seen COVID claims go from a 20% Recovery rate up to almost half of them have been obligated. CZU claims went from 15% to about uh, 30%. So we're seeing progress. Um, California, or the federal government has appointed what I'll call in a COVID czar that's focused on processing COVID claims. So we have seen progress in all of our efforts, but nonetheless, uh, the 2023 storm damage, we just can't recover from that. We don't have the funding to pay for all those recovery roads. So we must issue debt. And that's part of today's action is to set the hearing for May 14th. With that, that concludes um, an updated report with setting um, some public hearings for unified fee schedule for June 4th, uh, debt issuance on May 14th, and continuing con uh, starting in budget hearings on April 9th and available for any questions you might have. Uh, Chair Cummings, if I could uh, make a few comments just to reemphasize re a few points, sure. if you'd allow me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to add a few comments to um, Mr. Pimentel's um, pr presentation. Uh, this is actually a profound moment in county history as we deal with the impact of climate change on our um, total county budget. As you can see, we have been talking about climate change for years um, and knowing that the impacts were going to hit. Um, but now we are seeing the profound impact on our budget due to the disasters that we have had since 2017. So we have 2017, of course, the, the big storms in the, that year, and then 2020, the fire, as well as COVID. And then 2023, we had two disasters. Just to reemphasize the point that Mr. Pimentel had on this slide, we incurred $250 million of expenditures in uh, disaster response um, repairs to roads and and other infrastructure, $250 million over that time period. Uh, it's shocking to uh, think about that that's bigger than our discretionary general fund. So that what we call our net county costs or discretionary general fund is less than that. So we incurred those costs. We still have outstanding $143 million and um, we've, we've re uh, recovered $106 million. So there's two issues. The biggest issue is that we're going to have to issue that 80, potentially $85 million in debt 
which is one of the largest um, debt issuances that we have made for a capital project in, in county history. Uh, the good news is that we will get reimbursed for that, most of it over time, um, by the federal agency. So that's the very, very good news. And we certainly thank our partners at Federal Highways and FEMA and Cal OES uh, for that. The difficulty we're having is the timing of recovery of those funds. It's taking um, too long for our cash flow to be able to, to deal with. And then the other issue is because we're going to uh, issue debt, we're going to have to think of how to pay for that interest cost, which is not, um, we're, we're not covering that through this debt issuance, how we're going to pay for that interest cost. And then the other thing is that there's approximately 20% of the cost that we incur that are ultimately not reimbursed either through required matches of local funds or through unallowed uh, reimbursements. So 20%, um, we're gonna have to figure out how to pay for that, which is a significant amount of money as well that'll come from local uh, resources. So anyway, I just wanna emphasize that in this presentation, um, we're you know, bringing to the board you know, one of the profound issues that's gonna continue to, to affect us in the future because I can't imagine that this will be the last big storm we're gonna get hit by. And cities and county governments, as you see what's happening in Maui right now and what's happening in Southern California due to the storms just recently, what's happened across the state, across the country, we're all having to recalibrate how we're managing our funds because this is gonna become a bigger and bigger slice of our budget and something that we have not faced before. So anyway, I, I just wanted to reemphasize that point and reemphasize that we will be coming, we do have, we feel uh, solutions for how we're gonna deal with this. It's a very difficult problem. Uh, the part that we don't have solutions at, at yet is our local match, the interest costs, we're figuring that out still. And then the other thing is what happens if there's another big disaster? Just how are we gonna respond to that given that we are uh, stretching you know, our cash uh, resources to, uh, to the limit at this point? So we have to think of the future. Hopefully we'll get through this winter, but, um, and you know, the summer we start worrying about fires again and the next winter we'll get worry about storms and so forth. So anyway, that's a, that's another question. It's something that as we enter into our next strategic plan, it's interesting when you think of six years ago when we did our strategic plan, we thought of this issue, uh, but the next strategic plan, this is probably gonna be the biggest issue that we're dealing with uh, in addition uh, to all of the new state mandates, which Mr. Pimentel also uh, disclosed that we're gonna have to figure out how to fund those. So our next strategic plan is gonna look very different because this area of government is gonna grow and grow and it's gonna become something that all local governments are gonna have to wrestle with. Thank you very much for your for allowing me this time to come. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. And um, thank you, Mr. Pimentel for the presentation. I'd like to bring it back to the board to see if there's any comments uh, before we open it up to the public. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, well, a lot of numbers and not um, very promising. Uh, I just want to thank uh, our budget director, Mark Pimentel, and our CEO, Carlos Palacios, um, for keeping the community up to date on our fiscal health. Um, and it's been said by every board meeting we've had now for the past several uh, months that uh, can't be overstated that uh, we're in this position because we did the right thing and not the wrong thing. Um, we responded locally to the CZU fire, uh, COVID, winter storms, best resources we could af offer, to arrange shelter, fix roads, provide personnel, and deliver the critical health services that are needed. Um, but we need the federal government to help us further to cover these costs, as you've said. It's coming in the future, but uh, we need it now. And uh, I understand, FEMA, there's been uh, disasters throughout this nation, and uh, we... Uh, we're, we're just in line with a lot of other people. Can't wait till we get some of those, uh, but how we can match it is gonna be a critical question as was mentioned. And when you add the underperforming of uh, the CalPERS and the related costs to the county, in addition to our historic uh, property tax rates, which are the lowest in, in the state, I believe, we have a problem that needs to be addressed really structurally. And I, I hope um, we can do that to the best of our ability. I know we will, uh, but we really can't borrow our way out of this, um, uh, these challenges. Uh, I hope we can avoid major cuts by closing these gaps uh, and meeting ex or exceeding our revenue targets. I haven't seen anything as dire as this in my 11 years on the county board. 
but I want to thank our staff and the board and the community collectively that has come uh, together. Uh, and most people do understand the situation that we're in. It's a, it's a dire one. One thing I think, uh, realizing that the state is in some really significant uh, budget problems itself, but I just wish we could, I, I hope we can continue, and you've heard this from me before, that we, uh, please, state, don't uh, bury us with more unfunded mandates. That's, we don't need any more. I know you need, the state's in need of money, but uh, we're not the only county, but uh, we can see the picture here. This is uh, something that we really have to, uh, have to have to address but the state just stop it because they did this before and i remember uh under governor jerry brown he gave he said hey that's enough let's skip some of that back when things were better uh let's don't get so deep that we can't come back we're pretty deep into this anyway and uh the state needs to help us by not putting a bigger burden on us so thank you thank you supervisor hernandez Thank you, and thank you for the C to CEO Carlos for the comments that he added. You know, you mentioned that we have uh, roads to cover from here to Colorado, and so on that road to Colorado, uh, what what parts fails us the most during atmospheric rainstorms and fires? You know, I just want to illustrate to the public. You know, and both of you kind of touched on touched on it as well. But I want to illustrate to the public the dire need that we have, what the impact of roads, infrastructure as it pertains to emergency emergency repairs and, you know, the resiliency costs. Uh, what would be your guesstimation of these costs? Because I know in South County, you know, historically, we've always struggled to repave roads. And, you know, we just I was excited that we got this one repair on this one portion of the road. And it turns out that after this last rainstorm, um, another portion was damaged. And so I actually wasn't even, it was just close to my district, but I get the calls sometimes, you know. Uh, so, you know, I think Carlos mentioned that, you know, we are going to have to recalibrate the budget. At some point, we're going to have to really restructure how we operate and how we do things because it just keeps happening, right? Uh, but what do you think these costs, you know, how they impact us? Uh, I'll I'll take a, the first um, chance to oppo opportunity to respond to your question. The uh, one of the big challenges is that our county is located in a very difficult um, uh, geologic area, in that most of our land area and the unincorporated area is either in floodplains, coastal areas, or mountainous lands lands, and so um, that makes it. Very challenging. In fact, I believe FEMA at one point rated Santa Cruz County as the most prone to landslides in the state of California and 15th in the entire nation. Um, and so the, the geology, uh, just where we're located, makes it very challenging. And so when we look at the disaster repairs, which when we come back um, to do the debt issuance, we'll put a map of where all the projects were. There was hundreds of them where we most of them uh, landslide. Uh, creeks overflowing, all of you know, damaging roads. Uh, most of them, again, either in low-lying, flood-prone areas, um, and others in the mountainous areas as well. Uh, Mr. Reed, maybe you can comment as well. Yeah, um, it's a great question, Supervisor. I just wanted to bring your attention to a grant program that we are working on in collaboration with the Regional Transportation Commission. So R3, CDI, and RTC are looking at the climate adaptation and vulnerability assessment of all of our county maintained roads and the branch rail line corridor. So through that grant program, that's a Caltrans grant, we're gonna be trying to identify those most vulnerable areas to all of the impacts that you articulated and making a, a roadmap forward for how we build more resilience to those most vulnerable areas. So I just wanted to share that in the context of your question. Yes. Any other supervisors you'd like to make any comments, Supervisor Brown? Thank you. And appreciation on, on the presentation. I just want to underscore the context, which I think is important because post 2008, 2009 recession, the county still has less staff than it had at that time. There, there tends to, some, there's often a narrative about an increase in county costs, but I think that it's important to understand that, that, um, 
departments have less staff. I mean, public works about half the staff, plenty about half the staff of what they had in 2008, 2009. Um, so there, there hasn't been a growth in, in staff. There's been numerous revenue measures and attempts to try and stabilize on the financing side. Um, significant increase to Supervisor McPherson's point, both state and federal ongoing uh, requirements generally with two, one, two or three budget cycles worth of funding and no 100% ongoing funding, but still required in particular in the health and human services fields. So structurally, the county, and I know this is something Supervisor Koenig and I brought forward on the, the 13 and a half or so cents reimbursement that we get, uh, not reimbursement, 13 and a half cents we get on the property tax dollar. Structurally, there isn't a system that adequately builds us out of this in the next decade or two decades, absent a significant shift in how the property tax allocations come back to the county. And that is the underpinning of this. Because what's being asked of this board when we come forward in the debt issuance is to pay for things that have already been incurred. So we're not even looking at what may happen in the future when you already have additional structural issues. So even in a ceteris paribus situation, we're below zero. And if we have any additional things that get challenged to the county, we have no real plan, no real model that would actually address that. You can go to the debt well, or really this one time, frankly, and we wouldn't be able to do it moving forward. So there is, to Supervisor McPherson's point, we need to cut off one element of responsibility that's coming forward at the state and federal level, and I agree with that. But there needs to be a fundamental shift on the on the revenue side of money that people in this community are already paying. I mean, it's just but to make sure that it actually stays uh, with the unincorporated county, specifically with the county government, or it's not going to um, equalize. By the way, on the FEMA side, they are too also paying back previous disasters. So every time you see a new allocation in Congress for hundreds of billions of dollars, it's actually just going to pay off 2013, 2014, 2015, 16, 70. People think it's for the, the disaster that just occurred. That's the emotional component that gets it through Congress. But there are also uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars delayed in this. And so we're fighting against communities across the country in order to just get money that was guaranteed to us from either state or federal sources. It's a very, very, very challenging situation while the community is asking for greater investments. Right, The community wants new parks new roads, better flood protection. I mean, all very reasonable asks. These are basic tenets of government uh, service that we're unable to structurally uh, provide. So I think the context is really important as to why then the county comes forward with a measure K or why there's these various asks on TOT. Um, it's not that, that, that there's a desire to continually go back to that well. There's no, the structurally, it's a very challenging situation to do so otherwise. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Koenig. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to, well, first of all, definitely uh, agree with uh, the comments of my colleague, Supervisor Friend, as far as the need for some structural changes in the way property taxes are allocated, and clearly sales taxes as well. Um, I mean, if the state is going to uh, have these mandates that they force upon us, then they, uh, it would be nice if they would help us out with making sure that we can afford them. Um, I want to unpack something you said, Budget Director Pimentel, about uh, the I think about fifteen million dollars in FEMA claims that like it sounds like the federal government authorized, but then are held up at the state level. Is that because Cal OES is not in a position to basically contribute their twelve and a half percent, and so we they can't the money can't clear? Is that? Yeah, it's really in the process of cash flow with the state of California. Uh, the federal government obligates the claims, and then they're paid by the state. The federal government provides funding to the state to make those payments. At this point in time, the state doesn't have the cash resources to make these payments that we just got recently obligated. So they, they're typically we would have started seeing payments in May and June, and we'll, mm -hmm. we might see a little bit trickle in in June. Um, but it looks like most of it is projected. We're we're projecting out of September. We don't know, um, but that's that's the new problem for us that caught us off guard. Got it. Uh, then could you pull up the. Uh, slide that shows general fund projected deficits and kind of the different share of the different, um, you know, disaster financing, capital and facilities, state mandates. Um, I just want to unpack the capital and facility side a little bit. So I understand that with the, you know, up to $85 million bond we'll have to put out for disaster financing, that's the 
that's just to cover the money we expect to get paid back eventually uh, from the state and federal government. Um, but then is the part that that 20% that we are going to have to pay uh, just with, with local funds, is that in the capital and facility uh, section there? Or is that just, you know, a building is needs a new roof because it's 30 years old and uh, we've been delaying it. Now it's 35 years and we really better do it now. We'll, we'll see the disaster funding for the, if you think of the whole entire cost, 85 million to pay for the projects. And then we submit claims for reimbursement. We're expecting about 20, maybe as high as 30% that we'll have to pay it on our own. It won't be reimbursed by FEMA or, or Cal OES right. for a lot of different reasons. So there'll be 20, 30% of that 85 million that will just be here. It'll be our costs forever. So we'll, that's why May 14th, it'll probably be the hardest, most complicated debt financing I've ever presented in my mm-hmm. career. Or we're doing a combination of long-term debt for that portion of stuff we expect to never get reimbursed for. Shorter-term debt for stuff we expect to get reimbursed for, but it might take five to seven to nine years. Mm-hmm. And then some immediate lower-term debt, internal financing for stuff that might come in next year, next couple of years. So it'd be very complicated financing, um, but there'll be a portion of that debt that will stay in that blue bar forever. Got it. Um, in my career time, <laughs> forever. So we're talking 20, 30 years of long-term debt that will just be, be our, our obligation because feds and states just don't, won't reimburse in the right. entire cost. Right. Okay. So that's all in the blue section there. Um, can you unpack the orange section of capital facility a little bit? We, we have not had a sustainable model of funding capital. Like many government agencies, um, kind of post great recession went into the first place they cut, um, was, capital investments. That's why deferred maintenance has become such a big deal. It's not only on roads or infrastructure, but it's in our buildings. It's in this building. Um, it's in our healthcare delivery buildings. It's in our jail. A lot of our facilities have not had just minimum investments. So we're starting a program. We have to at least, at least get to 1% of our general fund of committed funding that we can start making investments in our facilities. Because we know like roadways, when it fails, that cost is triple or quadruples. If we can invest now, It'll extend the life and reduce those those costs. So this is something we must do. It's not optional. We're seeing failures across our county. Every year we're responding to failures. And very much like we've done with debt financing, when we've had failures in the past, we've gone out and issued debt to address those failures. So I, I just I think it's proactive for us to not wait for things to fail and to start funding them now and make sure they sustain themselves. So that's that's an ongoing commitment trying to get us to at least one percent of our general fund mm-hmm. going towards our investments in, in facilities across the county. And is that primarily, you know, as you said, facilities, buildings, or is there any contemplation of you know, trying it'll to take largely a more be proactive approach on we'll culverts? See some, or? We'll see parks. It'll be anything in the place of, um, so if we roll it back a little bit, our general services department is completing a facility condition index. We're doing a lot of great work in these last five years. Um, strategic plan, and now we're, we're understanding from our facilities, where are the next five years, where are the biggest risks at? So it's going to be a triage of addressing where our biggest um, challenges uh, to maintain and cost. So it'll be a prioritized based of based on assessments. Um, so it, it, it doesn't have any one particular focus. It'll just be how can we keep our, our, our facilities going before we have to start mm-hmm. um, either, because with this debt issue, uh, CEO process is correct. I've never done a debt this size. Uh, this complicated and it, it may be our last debt issuance for several several years so it, it you know it, it we're at the point where we have to start finding ways to not let things fail mm-hmm. right um i mean and i guess to that extent what expectations should we set with the public i mean i i know there was a number of projects for example in my district that were in the planning stage and we basically had to stop that because we realized that we were um you know actively out of funds does when we issue this debt, does that put us in the position to continue working on these projects or uh, are those just on the back burner until you know, something structurally changes? I mean, how, what, what expectations should we set with people who still are living with storm damage from, you know, certainly 2023, if not 2017? I, I think it's still complicated to answer to get to right now on on a specific project. We know we're trying to finish the work we've already committed to doing. Mm -hmm. We know we have some active projects out there. We're trying to use the work cobbled together financing to finish financing those projects that are active now. Something that's on the books that hasn't started yet. We don't have an option for that yet. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I, I wish there was a better answer, but I just have to be very candid about it right now. We, we don't have good options. Okay, uh, and then just last couple of questions. On the state mandates part, I mean, doesn't our state constitution protect us against unfunded state mandates? I mean, is there some way that uh, these are not actually mandates, but strong recommendations or something? I mean, what at what point and when could we actually push back and just say, no, we don't have the funds and you haven't provided them to us and this constitution protects us? It's a complicated answer. I'll, I'll... Yeah, so there's... Um... There is a process, uh, the State Mandates Commission. So there's actually a commission that de makes a determination on what is the state mandate and how, how we're going to be reimbursed. Uh, there was actually a lot of activity in this area. And then Governor Brown, when he came in, uh, he either relaxed a lot of the mandates or made them optional. And so, but they were things that, for example, I mean, one of the optional ones I think he did was advertising public meetings like this. Said, said you're strongly advised to do it, but we're not going to, you know, it's not required. But who's not going to advertise the public meeting, right? So there's thing, many, many things that Governor Brown did to relax the mandates standard, but strongly recommend them, and we kept doing them. Uh, but Governor Newsom has started doing new mandates quite actively again. So now there's going to be a process. So what's going to happen is we have to incur the expenditure, start doing the program, and then counties and cities are going to have to file claims that are going to go to the state mandates commission. There's going to be hearing, there's going to be evidentiary hearings. It's going to last years. And then eventually they'll make a ruling and they'll say, yes, this is a state mandate. And then the state then has to fund it. So they, so then what happens is they would, they have to actually appropriate money to fund it. And what happened in the past is they would let the bill get very big. And for years we wouldn't get funded. And then every now and then when there was a surplus that say, okay, we're going to fund this one mandate where you're owed and we have to fill out once there's a uh, mandate, the State Mandates Commission rules that there's a mandate, we actually have to collect a bunch of data, file a claim. Every jurisdiction has to file a claim, and then we have to wait on the state legislature and the governor to actually fund it. So what happens is, in reality, is it's a multi-year pro problem, and we get funded. It could take a decade to get funded. Meanwhile, we're being required to do the service. So there's a bunch of them. We will start doing them. And then we'll start filing claims. It'll work through the system. It could be four or five years easily before we see a check to get to come back. That's a pretty backwards way to do it, certainly. I mean, what if we just don't have the money to provide the service in the first place? I mean, then we will force the state to come after us and prove that um, we do. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And, you know, CSAC and the League of Cities have fought this battle for many years. I know. Um, Supervisor um, McPherson for years was in CSAC or is on CSAC board and representing that very issue. Uh, and Supervisor Fringe as well has been advocating as a committee chair. Uh, it's a, it's an issue for all of us that what you just said is is true. I mean, we're being required to spend general fund money and usually um, on and we may not we're not sure we're going to get reimbursed. And, and even if we do, it could take easily another five years longer. That's the history of of you know of this and these new mandates we imagine that some of the bigger counties are going to be the file the test claims that go to this the commission and uh, and because it's a very complicated process takes a lot of resources small counties like us are usually not involved in those test claims because it's too big a fight and it's a lot of expense to do that test claim but we imagine los angeles san diego other big counties are going to file those test claims and then we will start filing but for the in the meantime we're going to be spending the money and we have no assurance of getting reimbursed yeah well it sounds like a big fight Bruin. um yeah. the last question is just on property tax growth uh four and a half to six and a half percent i mean that's that's great how much is of that is coming just from sales and reassessments versus permit issuances to you know can actually construct new things and is there any way that we could um, potentially address some of the shortfall uh, for you know the coming uh, budget years just by hiring more folks in the assessor's office to speed up the process of you know making sure when those sales happen we are giving the money in in a couple of months versus you know year or two? Yeah, that'll be that'll be a focus of our budget this cycle. We're already working with the assessor's office to try to find some solutions now. 
that are before the budget season starts. Um, and we recognize that even with Prop 19, there's a lot of our assessments um, have the ability to, to increase up. Um, and we just have to get through the work. So we're, we're, we know as a county and as the office, they're just overwhelmed with the nature of assessments. So um, we are projecting based on their models that you know, there'll be some increases largely driven by those reassessments, largely driven by just normal um, sales transaction. I think in these next year, well, we won't see a, a hot real estate market. We'll see an okay market. Homes are still selling, but they're not selling as fast. But then our, in our out years as mortgage rates drop, we're projecting to see more transfers and that will trigger higher assessments. So it'll be a combination in about a year and a half of starting to see home sales to pick up pace again, and then the ongoing catch up of Prop 19 work. But now we recognize the need to get more support for our assessors team. Yeah, yeah. It seems like if we need more cash, then investing in the department that can actually bring that in would be uh, a wise move. And, and unfortunately, we have similar to. Supervisor Friend's point, we have similar stories across the entire county. There's a lot of places that need resources to move things along. Sometimes they're revenue driven and sometimes they're service delivery driven. And we're just, we're, we're continually have to make tough choices. All right. Thank you. Well, I uh, just want to thank everybody for the comments and want to thank you all again for the presentation. And I'll just say that as somebody who's come up in the science community, I mean, these, the, the projections that people were saying 20 years ago, what's going to happen with climate change if we don't reduce our CO2 emissions, they're all coming true. And um, I do want to thank the county for being proactive and trying to you know, make sure that we can protect our resources and community, our infrastructure to the best of our capability. I think one of the things that, that this presentation highlights is, is you know, the need for more revenue in our community, which is why this board unanimously voted to you know, put Measure K on the ballot, because you know, it's just showing that you know, we're going to need to have more revenue coming into our community in order to sustain what we already have, let alone, you know, the need for expansion, the need for more staff has been highlighted and just with the cost of living going up, making sure that salaries are keeping pace so that people can feel like they can still live in this community and aren't enticed to leave to move to other communities just because it's so expensive to live here. And so um, just really want to appreciate everything that went into this presentation. And I share a lot of the sentiments that were brought up by other members of this board on, you know, property tax and how we can work on increasing revenue within our county. Um, but with that, and in the interest of time, I'd like to open it up to the can I or, just, um, supervisor McPherson. Maybe I should wait for, uh, I, well, I, we don't have a, mo I just accept it, but I, I'd like to give additional direction that we write the governor and our elected representatives, uh, maybe the, uh, the speaker as well as Senate president pro tem that, um, the bind that we're in and that passing on unfunded mandates greatly exacerbates the problem we're having. I'd like to get that message out and get it to the governor and our elected representatives. But um, after we hear from the public, I'll bring it back to you so we can incorporate that additional direction. So at this um, time, we're taking it. Um, Public comment on regular agenda item number seven, which is a consideration of the general fund mid-year budget report uh, with related actions. And so we'll open up to the public to speak on this item. You'll have two minutes and you can please approach the podium. I don't think so. My voice. Um, it was. He turned it off. How's that? That's better. Great. Wow. Nobody wants me to raise my voice or extend my vocabulary. Maybe I'll just read some stuff. And this has to do with the budget. You know, I've been showing up. I think the first time that I suggested some litigation in the city of Santa Cruz was honestly the first time I can recall being hit by frequency weapons in the room. Glad my detox is better. So I have a lot of questions. You know, I don't know why people don't realize the only difference between human blood and plant blood is that humans are iron-based and uh, plants are magnesium-based. This CO2 thing, you guys are basing a lot of information on this, and it's just really terrible. So I'm going to just read some stuff. The founding fathers were not career politicians. They were outlaws. The angry extremist who refused to submit to the ruling elite. Never forget, it's a legal definition of mandate. 
you know, what's going on with the farmers, with the legislation that's being passed in Europe? They, their livelihoods are being destroyed in many ways that I could go on to for a long time. You know, climate change, my ass. Anybody trying to outlaw farming wants to kill us. We just haven't gotten to that point yet. So at the end, legacy is not legislation. I'm going to read something from John Locke, 1632, 1704. But first, I'm going to read this. A wise man once said, hate has four letters, but so does love. Enemies has seven letters, but so does friends. Lying has five letters, but so does truth. Cry has three letters, but so does joy. Negativity has ten letters, but so does positivity. Life is two-sided. Choose the better side. Yeah, I'll read what John Locke said. Whenever legislators endeavor to take away and destroy the property of the people or reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves in a state of war with the people, who are therefore absolved from any further obedience and are left to the common refuge which God hath provided. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Good morning, David Schwartz. Uncertainty abounds. The future is not clear. I think we need to be prepared for the less than optimum. We won't pass these issues. We won't be receiving additional revenue. What will we do then? The mandates, definitely. We need to fight against the mandates unless the state puts up the money first. We shouldn't have to pay for things and then get reimbursed. Look where that's gotten us now. So we need to stop doing this. We need to make some changes. One of the things is we need to change right now is this um, potential unfunded liability from our payroll where we're paying people benefits for the rest of their life. We've got to stop that now because we don't have the money to pay for it now. We're not going to have the money to pay for it in the future. And as you know, we're all aging out. That means that a lot of our employees will be retiring and will be funding that retirement out of our pockets. We don't have the money now. When will we have the $900 million we're going to need in 10 years? So we need more funding sources, we need to look at ways to save money. Number one, stop printing in color. Sure, that's not going to be much. But if you think about the number of pages that we produce, if you can save a penny a page, you're going to start saving money. Change that retirement system now. Anyone hired tomorrow and the next day will be on a defined contribution plan that you will be able to pay for. We'll have it in the budget. So little things make big differences. Let's get started now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for your public service. It's a thankless job. Uh, my name is Ed Lishin. I'm celebrating my 50th year here in Santa Cruz, and I've certainly seen a lot of changes over the period of time. I was born and raised in Atlantic City, New Jersey, a town not unlike Santa Cruz, a once great seaside resort that lost its businesses and its tax bases and chose gambling as an option to raise revenue, which hasn't worked out. My neighborhood where I was born and raised is now a prairie. There's no been real development there. I see comparisons to what's happening here in my city. In my county, stores are closing. Um, I didn't know I was going to stumble in on a uh, the finance and the budget discussion. Uh, that wasn't my original agenda for coming here. Uh, why I did come here was because I read that government pamphlet about the bond issue for the mental health. It was right on the first page. And, of course, to understand what's going on there, take a uh, legal mastermind. But when I saw they were going to take 5% away from the county, I thought, well, I really don't want to allocate that money to the state and sacrifice uh, my county. So uh, I'm probably going to vote no on that. And I don't really know the financial ramifications of it all. But 
Dad taught me there's no easy solutions to difficult problems. And certainly in the world today, we face a lot of difficult problems that we need to uh, deal with, at least not for ourselves, for our children and our children's children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, shocked to see the county is looking at an $85 million deficit. That's shocking. You know, when, when um, my family doesn't have money, we don't go out and buy a new car. We don't go out and buy a new house. And yet that is what the county has done. I, I really protest that, you know, the new um, South County West Marine thing is, is a lovely thing. But quite honestly, this county cannot afford that. It not only puts us in debt, but it also takes that real estate out of the um, property tax revenue that this county would have gotten. There are other examples that the Child's Crisis Center is a good thing, but can we afford it? No, we can't. And I think there are alternatives that you could have been examined. The county owns other properties already that could have been transferred into that use. We have to take care of what we have instead of going out and buying new shiny objects and putting ourselves in debt. We can't do that as personal families, and the county shouldn't do it either. That's why I'm voting no on Measure K, because it's a false promise that these things on the ballot will be funded, and they're not. It's simply going into the general fund. Um, I really encourage you um, also to be transparent about the other $87 parcel tax that you've all endorsed coming up from the Santa Cruz County Land Trust that will be on the November ballot. That's going to be another drain of the bucket of the people's finances. Our well is running dry, and you can't keep coming to us for more and more and more. We are an expensive place to live, and making it more expensive makes no sense. So you've got to learn to live under a budget just like the people do. And I urge you to work with CSAC to stop these unfunded mandates. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public hearing person who would like to speak to us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go online to see if there's members of the public online who'd like to comment on this item. Tim, your microphone is now available. Hello, thank you again for allowing me to speak. I, and I very much enjoyed the first gentleman's comments. I, he should still speak. It's always fun to hear him. Um, in regards to uh, federal and state, you know, they, they do need to value your, your county so much more. Same difference up in Tahoe. If you do get money from the federal government and the state, okay, you need to be tight-fisted with it. Don't just go run around and start spending the money, all right? Up in Tahoe, they're running around spending the money, and uh, <laughs> even with all that money, they, they want to come after me on my property taxes on the Nevada side of the lake. And for what? To build a transportation system so they can pump more people into our region. So then it's more elbow to elbow on the beach, and it's elbow to elbow on the ski hill. It's a complete disaster. And the thing is, if we have a fire in our region, we only have three roads out, we're all going to die up in the Tahoe area. So the thing is, is, you know, when I look at things like railroads on the coast and whatnot and so on, and all these agendas to pump a lot of folks into your region, all you're going to do is destroy your environment and you're going to create more problems. And then getting people out of a disaster situation is going to be horrible and you're going to end up in a Maui situation. So, you know, I think everyone needs to think long and hard about all this. You can't property tax your way out. And you need to, you did just need to think real long and hard about what you're doing with other people's money. And you don't want to end up in the same situation that the Tahoe Basin is in or in the situation that the people of Maui and all ended up in that we all know about. Okay. So it's all about water. It's all about climate infrastructure and conserving your cash so you can have a brighter future. All right. Thank you so much. You take it easy. Thank you. Call in user three, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, I'm looking at a 
like a picture of a pie, and it shows the Pentagon budget and the wars, like presently, is Israel slaughtering people in Palestine, uh, et cetera, taking over half of our budget. And Zach Ran, you talked about how the context is very important, and this is a very, very challenging situation. I think it's, it is, it's dire. And we need to have those funds not go to Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Raytheon and billions of dollars, but to provide for services here Food, not bombs, does it in the title. We could say food and county services and covering disaster costs, not millions, billions going to the military. And you spoke of climate change. It's, it's more than that. If you look at the sky and what's coming out of these geoengineering planes, uh, they measure dangerous levels of aluminum, aluminum and barium found in the soil and water samples taken nationwide. Both elements highly toxic. Tree and plant life is rapidly declining and human rates of respiratory and neurological ailments have risen exponentially with asthma at near epidemic levels in children. Aerosol programs are a global covert operation. Check out geoengineeringwatch.org. We need to Thank stop. you, Ms. Garrett. Brian, your microphone's now available. Hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples with uh, Trail Now. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, really supportive of, of the county workers and um, just wanted to, you know, most everybody knows I'm a one subject pony in the way of transportation, been involved in the transportation for over 25 years for Santa Cruz County. And I think the main point I want to make is I'm not sure if it's a really a revenue problem, but more of a spending problem. For example, when you're spending $20 million a mile to build a 12 foot wide trail, we know we have a problem. And your reason it's a 12, uh, such an expensive effort is because you're you're refusing to do the right approach which was given to you by the leading expert in transportation which was rail banking so i um you know when when you're building a 12 foot wide trail that costs twice as much as per mile than winding the highway we know we have a problem and what that transcend what happens then is the trail never gets built we never get our infrastructure built out when we have plans that are excessively expensive to do. So I encourage you to be more realistic in your planning in the transportation sector, which makes up a big portion of it. Thank you for your time. MILPA Collective, your microphone is now available. Yeah, good morning, uh, Chair, Board, Supervisors. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Bernard Gomez. I was born and raised in District 4, currently reside in District 3. Um, I'm just, uh, I think the county needs to start, you know, the saving money, you know, where it can. Um, and just really redefining what public safety means, you know. Uh, I believe that there's a lot of money being spent on a half empty jail, right? So um, I'm looking forward to this uh, to this budget season, this budget process, you know. Um, I want to thank Mr. Uh, Palacios and Pimentel for the work. Um, but yeah, I encourage the the board to really start thinking about how much money is going is being spent on this uh, current definition of public safety, which, you know, usually is uh, is met uh, law enforcement or incarceration. Um, 
the sheriff's budget continues to increase, right, while uh, crime rates continue to decrease. You know, there might have been a spike here and there, uh, but there is a lot of uh, need in that area, right, where the county can do better and have a more cost-effective way of providing alternatives to actually getting people the help that they need. And I don't know, hopefully, you know, relieving some of those uh, millions of dollars, right? Um, just currently, there is a whole unit that is empty. Um, and I'm just wondering how much money is being spent on those empty beds, right? And the, and the electricity and all those things, you know? Uh, but those are just my thoughts as of now. Um, and I look forward to this process this year. Um, I hope y'all have a good day. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you very much. And thank you everyone who uh, commented on this item. I'll bring it back to the board for action on this item. Um, I know that uh, Supervisor McPherson expressed wanting to um, add some additional direction to this item. So I'll recognize him first. This is just part of, um, I realize it's just part of uh, filling only a part of the puzzle, but um, I would ask that we accept the report uh, that was given um, and with the dire added direction that we write the governor of the Senate and Assembly leaders, as well as our local representatives and CSAC as well about our concern about the onslaught of unfunded mandates and the pressures it puts on our county government. Second. All right, so we have a motion by Supervisor McPherson and a second by Supervisor Koenig. Um, and I think we've covered all the bases with the actions that needed to. Just a clarification, it's for all the recommended. There's a number of other recommended actions beyond the accepting of the report. So it's for all the recommended actions. Okay. Yeah. So the recommended actions with the additional direction provided by Supervisor McPherson. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, uh, we'll take it to a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously, and thank you all for that presentation and for that update on the financial status of the county. With that, we're going to move on to um, the next item on our agenda, which is item number eight. Consider approving agreement with Integral Consulting in the amount of $692,608 to prepare a sea level rise, vulnerability assessment, and local coastal plan amendment and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO direct slash director of Community Development and Infrastructure. And so I'll turn it over to our staff to kick us off in this presentation. Thank you, Chair and Board of Supervisors. Um, so related to the previous discussion, this project is about preparing a natural hazard. Can you check to see if your mic is on? It is. Maybe I need to get closer. A little bit, yeah, okay. thanks. Okay, yeah, so uh, my name is David Carlson. I'm a resource planner in uh, Community Development and Infrastructure Department. And um, Again, related to the previous discussion, this project is about preparing for natural hazards. Um, and I wanted to define a, a couple of terms on this uh, introductory slide here. Uh, uh, first, a sea level rise vulnerability assessment is a study of how sea level rise will further impact development along our coastline that is already subject to flooding, storm surge, and erosion. And a local coastal program, program or LCP, is our local plan certified by the Coastal Commission that gives the county the authority to issue coastal development permits. And that includes addressing coastal hazards in those permit applications. The LCP needs to be amended because of policy conflicts that have developed with the Coastal Commission regarding how to address coastal hazards, climate change, and sea level rise. And we have to resolve these policy conflicts to improve and streamline the local permit process. Uh, so just a quick outline. Um, first, I'll provide some background information. I'll describe the project, uh, the process so far, uh, the contract or the vulnerability assessment, and then provide a recommendation. Um, a previous effort to update the coastal bluffs and beaches policies in the part of the LCP that is the general plan safety element resulted in a denial by the Coastal Commission. The policy and code amendments were intended to address climate change and plan for coastal resilience and the impacts of sea level rise. In their findings for denial, the Coastal Commission found policy conflicts with the California Coastal Act and recommended an approach based on a vulnerability assessment. The Coastal Commission has a grant program designed to fund the necessary studies and county staff began talking to them about a grant application. 
At their meeting on, in uh, September of 2023, the Coastal Commission approved our grant, giving us $780,000 to complete the studies and do the LCP amendment. The project will complete a series of technical studies on sea level rise, hazards, economic impacts, and adaptation pathways that will culminate in an LCP amendment addressing coastal hazards. There will be a robust community engagement plan and ongoing coordination with Coastal Commission staff throughout the various stages of the project because the goal of the project is an LCP amendment that can be certified by the Coastal Commission. Project tasks will be approached through a lens of equity and environmental justice, including outreach to historically marginalized groups and considering the value of the coast as a low cost recreational, social and cultural resource in the economic analysis. The county conducted a standard procurement process to hire a consultant for the project through a request for proposal or RFP process. I worked with General Services Purchasing Division to prepare the RFP. Um, and the RFP states that the grant includes $693,000 for a consultant. So all potential bidders knew about the grant and the available budget. The RFP was advertised in a normal way and it was sent directly to eight consulting firms identified by county staff as having completed similar work. We received one bid in response to the RFP and staff did some follow up to try to find out why that was the case. I reached out to five of the eight consultants we sent the RFP to and two of them got back to me. One had decided not to submit a proposal and the other apparently didn't receive the RFP because of a problem with contact information on their website. Um, it's apparently not unusual to get one or two responses on, it, on RFPs these days. CDI got one response on an RFP that it described elsewhere on this meeting's agenda and staff is aware of other recent similar RFPs that only got one or two responses. There's also another way of looking at this situation. The project is well known throughout the state to those involved in this kind of work. It's been the subject of two public hearings by the Coastal Commission in 2022 when they denied our last try at an LCP amendment and recommended we do a vulnerability assessment. And in 2023, when they approved our grant for the vulnerability assessment. Uh, the, C the Coastal Commission LCP grant program is the major source of funding for this kind of work throughout the state. And I would say that if a consultant has not been tracking our project and the grant funding and was unaware of our RFP, that in my mind would be a consultant shortcoming, not a problem with our RFP process. Fortunately, one qualified consultant team did respond to our RFP. Uh, Integral Consulting is the, the lead consultant on the project and they are a team of scientists, engineers and economists that have completed countless similar studies throughout the state. The list in your board member is only a partial list. All the references gave positive feedback. Uh, Central Coast Wetlands Group and Groundswell Ecology will assist with the vulnerability assessment and Blue Point Planning will conduct the outreach and stakeholder engagement. A team of highly qualified technical advisors will assist with the various aspects of the project and they're all described in the board memo. Uh, most of the team are locals and that keeps the grant funds in the local economy. I laid out the slide this way to emphasize the county's role in the project. Um, this is a really good consulting team and it's going to do some solid work for the county as an extension of the county. Uh, but the local decision making at the end of the day is going to on the LCP amendment is going to happen in this room by the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. With this team, staff is confident those decisions will be based on the best available science and on an inclusive process that engages all people equally. So staff's recommendation is uh, that the Board of Supervisors approve the agreement with Integral, uh, make a minor budget adjustment to align the contract amount and authorize the CDI director to sign the agreement. And that concludes my presentation, thanks. Thank you so much for that presentation. Are there any questions or comments from board members before we go out to members of the public? Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mr. Carlson, for the more uh, in-depth discussion and presentation on this item from the last time the board heard it at uh, our previous meeting. Um, you know, I've had, since since that meeting, did have the opportunity to talk with uh, various members of the community and I'm um, certainly and as your, your slide just outlined, um, the integral team uh, does include quite a number of experts. Um, I do think that they submitted a, a good bid that would provide a quality work product. Um, I think 
you know, my, my primary concern with the, this process, I mean, and first of all, a question for county council, is there anything in this RFP process um, that could open us up to liability down the line? I mean, is there anything about this that, um, you know, anyone could argue was improperly conducted? Because I'm concerned that if if there were, if we were to uncover anything, that ultimately it could uh, invalidate, uh, you know, the final, the final product of a, of a new local coastal program amendment. No, I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Um, so that's one component. Um, and then I think the other is just making sure that uh, many of the people who will actually be impacted by this work uh, also feel just confident in the process itself. I mean, that is basically democracy in a nutshell, right? Not always the most efficient process, but ultimately meant to uh, build uh, understanding, buy-in, and uh, uh, it's not always agreement, at least acceptance of the final outcome. So, um, Anyway, those are sort of my position generally, and I look forward to hearing what members of the public have to say. And other members of the board have any questions or comments? Supervisor Hernandez? Yeah. So you said that there was uh, several consulting firms that were that got sent that RFP. How many was that again? Eight. Eight. And with the... Um, Has there been any municipalities already or, you know, any counties that have submitted an LCP and that they have the same kind of response rate, a low response rate for these RFPs? If you know, I'm not sure if you know that or not. Yes, I am aware of at least two cases where the responses were one or two responses to the RFP for similar type of work, one in Northern California and one in Southern California. That's it. Seeing no further questions or comments, we'll open up to the public. Um, members of the public will have two minutes to comment on this item before we bring it back to the board for action and deliberation. Good morning. My name is Steve Perret, and I'm president of the Coastal Property Owners Association of Santa Cruz County. CPOA had supported the Coastal Commission's grant as well as the county's release of the RFP due to the county's limited time and resources available to conduct the vulnerability study. However, CPOA is opposed to the county's recommended contract award with Integral Consulting. In our opinion, the RFP process was flawed. It did not reach some of the major coastal consulting firms, did not provide for any opportunity for public input, and would not be in the best interest of the county, the public, or the coastal property owners. We therefore urge the Board of Supervisors to direct staff to reissue the RFP and to ensure it reaches the appropriate contact people in each of the other major coastal consulting firms and extend the deadline for 30 days. Our major concerns are that the RFP process did not allow for public input, even though this will affect billions of dollars of coastal real estate throughout Santa Cruz County. CPOA had requested the county provide a list of respondents to the RFP and our request was declined. CPOA then requested the county provide a list of the consulting team so that we could vet the qualifications and potential biases of the consulting team. Our request was declined. The integral consulting team has potential ties with the Coastal Commission and Surfriders and does not include coastal engineers. Some of the major consulting firms, including Dudak, Woods, Ascent, Smith, and Rincon have all indicated they never received the county's RFP. CPOA contacted Dudak Consulting, who is working with other cities such as Santa Barbara, Oxnard, Ventura, and Encinitas, and they are very interested in submitting a proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Jenny Dujak. Can you speak right into the mic? Oh, how's this? That's better. My name is Jenny Dujak. I'm a career science writer. I've been working on a book on shipping ports and sea level rise, and I have been going to meetings of the American Geophysical Union for several years. Each year that I go, uh, the projections for sea level rise are worse. I just want to make that point. Um, I would urge the count. I can't speak to the RFP, which somebody just addressed, and whether that was done right or whether you need 30 more days or whatever. But I would urge the county to expedite the vulnerability assessment and begin planning for sea level rise as soon as possible um, and long-term sea level rise. Finally, let's see. <laughs> um, 
think long term. Don't fall for short term thinking or holding actions. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Next speaker. David Schwartz, candidate for District 2. Um, I didn't realize you actually had a grant on this one. It was very interesting uh, to find out that you've actually gotten this funded by someone else. I think that's great. But I just had an idea about this. We do a lot of studies and plans and, and things like that. And I, I wonder why we're not using our brain trust. You know, we're, we're surrounded by colleges, UCSC, Stanford, Monterey Peninsula, uh, even Cabrillo. And all of these have programs that study these types of issues. And we could offer something like a $100,000 uh, scholarship program to the winner of a contest, let's say, where the best program, the best study could could garner some group, let's say, uh, a, a, an opportunity to extend their education that they might not necessarily have an opportunity for or something like that. So thinking ahead, you know, we want to have more of our, our kids involved in what's going on, our younger folk involved in our government and such. So why don't we bring them in? We have these opportunities and we might even save some money doing it. So think about that. It might be something in the future that we could definitely do. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Howdy. My name is Drew Lanza. I'm a registered voter in our lovely county. I'm on the boards of Smart Coast, the board of the CPOA. And until last month, I was on the board of Power Dunes. I resigned specifically to focus on the blossoming, blossoming LCP process. I'm now sat on over 50 boards. I'm an expert in fiduciary duty. Look, we all know there are two core fiduciary duties, right? Care and loyalty. Briefly, to do what a prudent person would do in service of the constituencies their board serves the citizens of the county here and the people who do business here, I suppose, too. What are the consequences of failing to achieve that plain spoken stand? Well, look, you can't be sued and the board can't be sued. But multiple legal precedent, your decision can easily be overturned if you breached your fiduciary duty. There is credible evidence. Maybe it's real evidence, maybe it's not, but there are credible. I've spoken to these people that you only had one response to the RFP because it was never sent out, whatever the heck sent out means. The general rule for government RFPs, I've served on boards like yours, is that you need to get at least three responses. There's actually a law, it probably doesn't quite apply to us, but the general principle holds, right? Go get as many as you can. A rule which also as a generally accepted guideline dictates an active outbound effort. I want you to think about your fiduciary duty, okay? You've, you've kind of broken the general rule of more than one, and why was that? Just ask. Just postpone this decision for a day or two. Finally, your failure to address my challenge, given someone of my experience, credibility, and history, will put you in breach if you don't answer that question. Thank you. I think you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. Thank you. Welcome, Director Machado. Thank you, and good morning, um, Chair and Supervisors. Matt Machado, your Director of CDI. Uh, I just want to share a perspective. We work with a lot of consultants on all different types of projects, so we know the process well. And to be successful, we reach out. I mean, we want to be successful. I would say that uh, some of the best project success we have is when we find a consultant that's engaging, that's collaborative, uh, that responds to our requests. And in essence, uh, consultants are really just extensions of our staff. And we together work through that process. And oftentimes, especially in this case, we will have a public community um, process and we'll work together to bring um, ideas and recommendations to your board, to the planning commission. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for public input and direction and decision-making uh, at this step of the process, we're really just trying to bolster our staff so that we can do good work uh, so that you all can give good direction and make good decisions. And so I would um, defend our process. Uh, we did reach out to eight consultants. Um, the uh, consultant that's being recommended today, Integral Consulting, did reach out. They've been very engaging. They've been very collaborative. And we believe that 
they will be a great extension of our staff so that we can produce good work that can be reviewed by the public, that can be, you know, that we can receive adequate input and that, you know, at the end of the day, we have a good product that, that your board will be uh, happy with. So I just wanted to share that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. We'll invite the next speaker here in public. Hello, Board of Supervisors. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. And thank you for all the great work that you do here in Santa Cruz County. Um, my name is Sean Burns. I am here on the Santa Cruz World Surfing Reserve, a program of Save the Waves Coalition who's based here in Santa Cruz. Uh, we have 12 World Surfing Reserves around the world and our main one here in Santa Cruz extends from Natural Bridges um, over to Capitola uh, city limits. And so um, we are, you know, we have a local stewardship council and we look for the best ways to manage the world-class waves here in Santa Cruz. And as we know here in Santa Cruz, we have world-class waves, but we also have a very dynamic coastline that requires um, someone that's very, you know, local and members of the community to look after the waves and the coastline. Um, and so how we do that through the World Surfing Reserve is not necessarily just through surfers, but it's also through scientists. And one of those consulting groups that we work with, um, a key component of the World Surfing Reserve is Integral Consulting. I think they're a very local group that has the capabilities to work here in Santa Cruz on that dynamic coast that there is. Uh, we've been working with them through multiple projects. One is the surfonomics of Santa Cruz and understanding the revenue that surfing brings Santa Cruz. Um, so we have full trust in Integral in taking care of this LCP. Um, and I just want to say another thing is, you know, keeping it local, keeping it here in Santa Cruz, how dynamic and how ever changing this coastline is. I think keeping it to someone that's here in Santa Cruz, understanding how dynamic the coastline is, is very important and goes to show is they're the number one um, consulting group that uh, submitted a, a RFP. So um, thank you very much. And I hope the board can uh, accept the proposal from Integral Consulting. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Charlie Eady, uh, planning consultant to Paro Dunes. Uh, I'd like to point out that we have participated, Paro Dunes, in the past in the LCP process. And our main goal is to participate again actively and collaboratively. We specifically would like to request that we have a seat at the table in the stakeholder advisory group and that you direct staff to ensure that happens. We were disappointed, like you and the staff, at the Coast Commission's denial of your LCP previously. However, I think there's four bits of good news that I'd like to share. First of all, the county's innovation of the area-specific policies was initially was rejected by the local Coast Commission staff, but now is actually an approach being embraced by the new executive director, and local government working group who are speaking more positively about flexibility and locally generated solutions. So we're looking forward to continuing a ground up process. Secondly, there's new science, best available science. The Ocean Protection Council just updated the sea level rise. Um, projections and they're substantially lower in rate and amount than the previous projections that have been used by coastal mm -hmm. so coastal is going to be updating their guidance on that third there's going to be some legal clarity coming out of the casimir decision on the uh, coast commission assertion that existing development is only pre-1977 you should have an answer to that and if it goes with the way of the trial court then one of the major objections for the Coast Commission would be rejected. And then finally, there's a plethora of new technologies, hybrid technologies. Pyro Dunes is a good example of that. We've got revetments that were built in the 80s that have since then worked to uh, enhance the sand, higher dunes, wider dunes, and a sustainable beach. So thank you, thank you sir. Thank comments. You. Appreciate them. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Carol Turley. I live in the Interlaken area of South County, and I'm the general manager of Pajaro Dunes Association. Pajaro Dunes is a unique coastal community with strong interest in protecting the special natural resources that surround it. With 36% of the 565 residential units available for short-term rental, we provide opportunities for people to enjoy the coast, and we provide significant transient occupancy tax. 
We offer gratis meeting space to nonprofits such as Leadership Santa Cruz County and Loaves and Fishes. We'd be happy to host one of the LCP meetings if, if David finds that appropriate. And we look forward to participating in the LCP process. Um, yeah, my name is still James Ewing Whitman. Really appreciate the public participation. I certainly learned quite a bit about fiduciary trust and it's quite different on the other side of this maritime courtroom, fiduciary trust malfeasances. It's probably in my top five subjects talking about what's going on. You know, Santa Cruz is not an island just because there's a great deal of evidence 250 years ago to 500 years ago that Santa Cruz was indeed an island. You know, 2024, 2025, there are some really magical times in our solar system. You know, the whole flat earth thing should really be solved by this October. Why? Because we're having an event that supposedly hasn't happened since 79 AD. You know, but we've had other events like that in the last hundred, several hundred years. So it's really interesting what's going on. More consulting for, for what? You know, we talk about the various issues with the weather and the storm damage. But how come human beings are so much weaker and all other life is so much weaker? People aren't talking about the chemtrails. You know, there are some natural things going on that my understanding is the four modern religions talk about it. Why is 2024 so special? So what's really going to happen when we really have some serious issues? How are we working with each other to really help each other? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. When I saw this, I really wondered why DUDEC didn't apply. That was a shock to me. They're local. They've, I mean, they're huge, but they've got a local office, just like Integral is huge, but it has a local office. They're not a mom and pop shop at all. They're, they've got offices in Mexico, all over the place. So they're not a, a local per se. They're just like DUDEC. And DUDEC has done a lot of environmental um studies and, and reports for the county. So I was shocked to see that they weren't, uh, that they had not submitted. And I'm even more shocked now to hear from the gentleman earlier that they didn't even receive it. So this kind of practice and, and um, problem clouds this whole process. And I think the county would be wise to pause and send them out again, make sure with a phone call that they did receive them, all of them all of the consultants. And to say that it's the consultant's fault if they weren't tracking projects that might need their help, I, I think that's um, I think that's rather amazing. I, I wanna make sure that the climate model that is used is consistent with what is being used in other arenas in the county. Within the Mid-County Groundwater Agency and the city of Santa Cruz water, they're using different climate change models. And this has to be, um, standardized we can't be basing information on different different models that are completely different um i really would like to see the pajaro dunes folks on at the table as well as the real estate industry because i am concerned that this will have a huge impact on the real estate industry and people's property rights and people's property values and they should be at the table and then finally, just a point of order, um, Chairman Cummings, I know you are on the Co Coastal Commission, and I can I would like you to consider whether you should recuse yourself from this decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. I'm Dr. David Revel, I'm the principal in charge putting together that proposal from Integral. Um, I've been working in this field for many years. I received four different inquiries to team on this RFP with teaming partners that I've worked with on and off for decades. Um, I told them I had a local team that's done a lot of work here in the county, and many of them said, thank you, we're probably not gonna go after it. That's common practice in the field. With you respect your colleagues and frequent teaming partners, let's not waste each other's time. There's a lot of this kind of work out on the streets right now. I've done the same thing and declined to go after projects. One of them do deck just one. So 
Um, I'm very familiar with the field. I'm here mainly today to say that we have a local team. It involves three local professors. Um, so we are using the brain trust here in the county um, it, and in the Monterey Bay region. And mainly I'm just here if you have any other specific questions about our proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public here in person who would like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, we'll go to see if there's anybody online who'd like to speak to the board on this item. Brian, your microphone's now available. Yes, hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. Uh, first of all, we support this because it will help educate the community on what can really be built along the coastline. Um, it's not real difficult to understand the Coastal Act, which is basically uh, beach access and sea level rising requirements as well as other things. Um, also want to recognize Matt Machado and his team's work. I think uh, providing this expertise and this discipline will help his team be successful and they're doing phenomenal work. So I appreciate the work they're doing. Um, but I want to just step back and remind us that down in Los Angeles and Southern California, they're developing plans to relocate the railroad tracks inland. And those railroad tracks are existing passenger rail and freight lines. They're existing. So when a community down south is relocating it, it's pretty straightforward the direction our community should be heading, which is, you know, basically you're not going to ever have a, a future passenger rail that operates along Manresa Beach, along the coast, co uh, coastal cliffs, over by Capitola and Park Avenue. So hopefully this work from the consultant will help educate the community. And I appreciate the time to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, your microphone is now available. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak again. Um, yeah, the train concepts, you know, I'm down on that 100%. And the, the last gentleman that just spoke about, you know, Southern Cal and moving the train and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Southern Cal, it's ridiculous. It's not very enjoyable when you're staying in a hotel down there and you hear this train just all night long just going by. It's rough and it pumps all these people into the region. And you can tell flat out it's damaged the environment. I remember it when I was a kid back in the 70s, and it it didn't look like that. It was so much nicer. So you have a lot to lose here, you know. And the thing is, is uh, you know, when it comes to corporations, consultants, and developers, and conflict of interest, good lord, that's exactly what's going on up in Tahoe. And some of the folks that are uh, on boards and stuff like that, and that are in the politics and everything they're related to the developers and there's all sorts of conflict of interest going down and the tahoe basin is epically destroyed so they have a problem with garbage not a problem with rising sea levels and um you don't want you know hordes of people storming your communities and just making life uncomfortable for everybody to the detriment of your local population your kids your kids that want to go surfing and whatnot so you need to take a hard look at that SDRs, SDRs are a disaster in Tahoe. That's another angle that's terrible. So one last comment, just wanted to say, I didn't mean to offend anybody or weaken my position when it comes to Republicans and so on. And, you know, I apologize for my failure to articulate. Um, I just don't like Trump because of his positions regarding Lincoln, World War II, and Reagan. And as a Republican- Sorry, Sorry I don't want to cut you off, but we are speaking about sea level rise. Correct. When it comes to Trump, he's a danger to your community when it comes to that, just so you know. Thank okay? you. Thank you very much. Bill, your microphone is now available. As a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Bill Dessler. I've been an owner at Pajaro Dunes Shorebirds for almost 50 years. I've been a member of the Community Affairs Committee at Pajaro Dunes for 20 plus years. I've watched over the past 50 years the very consistent beach level uh, over those 50 years. And the sand level varies during the year. 
but after 50 years, it's about the same, or maybe even a little more beach. And, but I'm sure the next 50 years will be different, but I don't expect any immediate changes. Uh, the county LCP is very important to us, and that we want an LCP that doesn't force us out of our property just based upon LCP rules. When we leave our property, we stop paying property taxes and we lose our property. Uh, we are very disappointed that the current contract has a, such a controversy and hope that the staff will clear up this any misunderstandings in short order. Yesterday, several of us had a, a, a long conversation with uh, our supervisor, Zach Friend, and we respect his opinions and standing on this issue and his position on this issue. We've had a good relationship with the county planning staff in the past, and David Carlson has been a big help to us in the past, and we hope to continue to be involved in this, as this next LCP is written. Thank you. Thank you. Call in user three, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, it seems like we're rearranging chairs on the Titanic with all the global disasters and sea rise and flooding, et cetera, going on. And it seems like we're being massively assaulted by military profiteers and polluters. The crumbs the county has left over after the military siphons out, most of our funds seems poorly prioritized, and this item seems like a financial waste to me. Um, my cat's by the phone. <laughs> and, the, and another item on the agenda is um, the county on item 19 assumed financial responsibility for petroleum underground storage tanks. That should be the responsibility of those who own those tanks. What is the county doing with our money that seems so unwisely uh, spent? Uh, this doesn't seem like uh, a worthwhile funding for this item. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you. Um, so I'd like to see if staff has any comments or follow up on anything that was said during public comment. And if not, we can bring it back to the board for further discussion and for action. Well, I mean, I think I think the most important thing I could say is absolutely we're going to include all uh, groups on uh, that are, uh, in, on the stakeholder advisory group that they're requested to be part of it, and um, and the outreach is going to be extend beyond that. Excuse me, is that is it, you mean the technical advisory committee? I just how is that going to be selected so forth? That, um, excuse me, Mr. Chair. There are various groups that are outlined in the grant application. So we're gonna definitely include all those groups, property owners, recreational groups, surfer groups, um, other community organizations. So it, it it's, hasn't been selected yet, but that will be one of the first orders of business to create that group that can work together and that is representative. It's a direct uh, Thank voting. you. Thank you, Chair and Supervisors. I just wanted to add that uh, this is a professional services contract, and it's it's quite a bit different than, say, a construction contract where, you know, like lowest bid and we're looking at pricing and responsiveness. We're looking for qualifications. And in the industry, and you kind of heard that from, from the recommended consultant talking about how the teams are trying to put the best team together. And so this isn't the same thing as construction. This is putting the best team together to be the most responsive to our needs so that we can craft good good information so that you can review and consider and and that we can all work together on it. So it's quite a bit different. And, and for the most part, all of our consultants, their hourly rates are almost the same. They're almost identical. And so this is not about that kind of a competition. This is about who can put the best team together 
to be the most responsive and to be right into the into the core and the meat of the the topic. So I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page with that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Supervisor Hernandez. Would it be I'm sorry, would, would possible public, to public, that? No, public comment is cut off. I'm sorry, you had your time. You're thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you. So I had the opportunity, you mentioned it, but the um, previous reading of this in September 20th of 2022. And, you know, for me, I think it's, you know, with an outcome like that, that, that occurred, that all eyes wouldn't be on us, even without an RFP. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and move the motion to consider the agreement with the integral consulting to prepare sea level rise vulnerability assessment and local coastal plan amendment and take related actions A through B. Um, I would like to add some additional, you know, making sure that we do formally um, invite the groups that have had interest in, in this process uh, as part of the process. And I'm not sure if that's already included in that process or we have to make that additional direction, but I think you said there are several forms of them to participate. So I'd like to make sure that we do get that and we get their input as well. That is part of the process for sure. Okay. It's in the RFP. Okay, so motion by Supervisor Hernandez. We have a second. Second. Second by Supervisor Friend. Um, are there any further comments from board members before we move forward on this item, Supervisor Koenig? Sure. Um, I'll just say I plan to vote against the motion. Uh, I believe that, you know, given we have a study here that's better part of a million dollars affecting billions of dollars worth of property, uh, taking a just another month or two in order to re-advertise the bid. I, and I did have a chance to speak to some of the other consultants in this space, including Dudek, who said they would be very interested in submitting a bid if the process was reopened. Um, you know, I think ultimately it's just going to make sure that the county gets the best value for its money. I, I think very very well integral could be uh, could be that, but um, it always helps to be certain in these situations, especially when uh, it's going to have such a big impact on our community. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I'll be I'll forward some of the emails that I've got to you so that make sure that some of those interested parties, you know, get the invite. So yeah, I think person. I'm going to be uh, supportive of this, which is different from before, but uh, I. I think that uh, I've seen the the process has gone through. I have the highest respect for Mr. Carlson and uh, I'm appreciative of the grant that we received. I think um, the contract um, will cover what we need to do with a, a qualified uh, consultant. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Uh, just briefly, I think that the, irrespective of who was selected here, I, I mean, because for those of us that, that were on the board during the process previously and had a lot of meetings, the three of us that were on, it was very challenging to try and find a space where the Coastal Commission looking for a statewide model and local property owners in Smart Coast looking for, in essence, the opposite, could come to a middle ground. And we need to start with the reality that that's where we're starting from. And we're kind of projecting onto consultants a viewpoint when they're not the deciders. So I think that we also need to be balanced in our approach of understanding that the board sends this forward to the Coastal Commission. Staff is actually writing before. To me, I think what matters is ensuring that there is a sense that voices weren't heard in the first process. I don't actually agree that that's a fair sense, by the way. I think David did an outstanding job. I think a lot of us had a lot of meetings. But because the end result didn't come out the way people liked it, they challenged the process. So to me, and that's common, where you challenge the policy because you didn't like the process, not necessarily always the same thing. In this case, um, I think that what I would just encourage David and Integral to do is you've heard that there's a sense that there want, people want to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, and so lean in pretty heavily to some of those. I thought the comments from Power Dunes folks were outstanding today for that that purpose. They understand that this is necessary. They also want to make sure that that the uniqueness of what they're doing is heard. And so that's why I'm supportive of this, but I also want us to be realistic that we could have this process go on, I mean, realistically forever, and you would never actually choose somebody that met everybody's preconceived needs right before we were able to move this forward. So I think that we have a very qualified set of, of team right here. I mean, you can't, some of, I mean, unimpeachable, quite frankly, on some of these, these qualifications, and so I'm prepared to move forward. 
Hey, I guess I'll make some brief comments before we go to the vote on this. I just want to appreciate SAP's work, um, all the feedback that we've received on this item to date. And um, and I do want to comment on something that was said around kind of our fiduciary responsibility um, around how we move forward with this item. Last year, the Coastal Commission awarded 14 grants throughout the entire state to conduct these kinds of studies. And we were one of those 14 jurisdictions that received that funding. And on the previous conversation that we've been having around the fiscal impacts and the, the fiscal challenges that we're gonna be facing, along with the impacts of um, climate change that have been you know, driving up some of the debt that we're seeing in our community, we should be very lucky and we should feel very fortunate that we have funding from the Coastal Commission to do this kind of study that's gonna really help us understand as we're being impacted by climate change, where are the most vulnerable areas uh, along our coast? And you know, when it comes time for us to make a decision, you know, it's gonna be up to us as a body to decide what amendments we wanna make to our local coastal plan based on the recommendations that we receive. Um, it's also gonna help us understand, do we want to, for example, try to armor certain areas? Do we think about managed retreat? Are there other options we wanna consider? But in order for us to get to a point, we can make that decision we need to understand what is the baseline of where those vulnerable points are along our coast. And so I think that this is, um, you know, it's great that we were able to get this grant. I think that we've heard that the community wants to have a strong voice and be involved. That's outlined in the agenda report that we have before us. And um, and so I'm very supportive of this and um, hope that we can, you know, continue to engage with integral you know, consulting and have strong engagement with the community. And I do want to just point out that this project timeline starts now and it goes through 2026. So this isn't going to be something that's just like overnight. We're going to pull together data and throw out a report. There's going to be a lot of engagement engagement and a lot of um, data collection to get to us to a point where we can make a really sound decision that's based in science. And so um, just want to echo comments made by Supervisor Friend. I think Integral Consulting is a highly qualified firm to conduct this work. And I think that the more we delay, it also sends a signal to the Coastal Commission that we're not being fiscally responsible with funds that they've decided to give our community, which could jeopardize us trying to apply for grants with them in the future if they don't see us and following through on what we um provided direction onto our staff when applying for these kinds of grants. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll on this item. Uh, there was a motion by Supervisor Hernandez uh, with additional direction to ensure that community members who are concerned will be included in the, the uh, community engagement process, seconded by Supervisor Friend, and I'm asking for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? No. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. That passes with Supervisor McPherson, Hernandez, Cummings, and Friend voting in favor, and Supervisor Koenig voting in opposition. Um, and with that, um, I'm just going to check in with the board to see if we want to take a short break or if we want to keep powering through. We've got two more items on our open session. Ready to go? Yeah. Power through. Okay. Let's keep going then. Um, so the next item on our agenda is item number nine, consider approving in concept Ordinance repealing chapters 2.56, 2.60, 2.84, 2.92, .2 .2 and 2.125 of the Santa Cruz County Code to sunset various advisory commissions, schedule the ordinance for second reading and final adoption on February 27, 2024, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And with that, I'll turn it over to Randy Morris and Nicole Coburn. Thank you, Chair Cummings and members of the board. I'm Nicole Coburn. I'm one of the assistant CAOs, and Randy Moore, Director of Human Services, is here with me today. Um, so at our last meeting on January 30th, the board received a report uh, with initial recommendations on county commission restructuring. This was following a comprehensive review of our county's advisory bodies, uh, many of which were established more than 45 years ago. Recommendations in that report and presentation addressed various commission consolidations, retirements, and transitions to other methods of accomplishing some of the same duties or purpose of those commissions. The board at that time, at that meeting, amended the recommendations to remove one of the commissions, the Emergency Medical Care Commission, from the list of those that we were recommending to be sunsetted. This resulted in five commissions that would be eliminated as of March 31st, 2024, um, based on the ordinance that's before you. The five commissions are the Environmental Health Appeals Commission, the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, 
the Human Services Commission, the Substance Use Disorder Commission, and the Syringe Services Program Advisory Commission. Um, I do want to note, and um, Randy is here to answer any questions, that as a follow-up to the January 30th meeting, Human Services has been working with County Council and continues to work with the ad hoc committee of the current commission, um, the, of the current Human Services Commission to draft bylaws for the new de department advisory group that is being recommended. Uh, this ad hoc committee is going to bring forward draft advisory group bylaws to the next and final Human Services Commission meeting, which is scheduled for March 20th. The bylaws will include language that offers all current commissioners the opportunity to, to remain members of the department advisory group. The bylaws will also contain language that aligns with the county code, which speaks to departments ensuring that members are representative of our county demographics. Human Services is also going to continue to post the agendas and minutes on its public facing website, which they're currently in the process of doing a refresh on. And then our office is also looking into um, the possibility of extending stipends to advisory group members. This is under review. Um, we're in the process of gathering some additional information and then we'll return to the board with an update and any recommended actions. Again, we wish to thank all current and former members of these commissions that were recommending Sunset for their dedicated services to the Board of Supervisors and the County of Santa Cruz. And in conclusion, um, we want to request that the board approve the recommended actions and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Um, are there any board members who have questions on this item? This is one that's returning to us again for first reading. Seeing none, we'll take it out to the public. Are there are any members of the public who would like to speak to us on item number nine, which is um, consider approving a concept and ordinance that's repealing um, the sunset of various advisory commissions. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I want to again protest the sunsetting of the county's hazardous materials commission. And um, it, it seems to be a done deal, but where do members of the public go to report um, problems with underground storage tanks. It was that commission that I went to that did get action against uh, Swenson taking out in the middle of the night a, a storage tank that had spilled all kinds of we don't know what because they covered it all up. And it was I had gone to Environmental Health Services staff and nothing happened. It was that commission that made something happen that prompted the district attorney, Ed Brown, to take action. So where do we go when things like this happen now? When and if this commission is taken away from us? I also um, want to ask that while commissions are being reviewed, such as what Mr. Morris is doing, that there be a standard uh, set of rules of um, order. I attend um, a few commission meetings and they're talking about this now. Some are operating under Rosenberg's rules of order. Some are still operating under Sturgis, which is what your board used to do before you changed to Rosenberg. So that needs to be standardized among all commissions. Um, and um, finally, I, I hope that the testimony that I heard when this came before your board before by Mr. Mark Yellen, director of Dominicans ER was taken to heart. Um, it, it is not often that you have someone of that import calling in to say, don't annihilate this commission. It is a value. Thank you. Thank you. But any other members of the public who are here in person who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, we'll go to online to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us. Call in user three, your microphone is now available. Um, what Becky Steinbrunner just cited is critical reason to keep some of these commissions hazardous waste and environmental health. What is more important than a healthy environment that isn't loaded with toxins? We are already exposed to so many um, poisons, like the umbilical cords of babies found to have over 200 chemicals in it. That's just one indication. 
why would you want to remove these commissions? What is being covered up and why? And why are polluters allowed to pollute in the first place? We have a structural problem here, and it seems like these commissions are critically important in this environment. And it only seems to me that removing them is giving a license to kill, basically, to these corporations that are doing this damage. And I, I include the wireless microwave corporations as well. Okay, those are my comments. We need to keep these advisory commissions. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, your microphone is now available. Thank you so much again for allowing me to speak. Um, for the last speaker, um, although I don't totally ag agree with her on some of these things that she's saying, especially with regards to like Lockheed and our military and whatnot, I do agree with her that we probably shouldn't be banning these commissions because, you know, I, I don't want corporations to be in any more of a powerful position to abuse our communities when it comes to our environment and toxins. So I am concerned about that. And, uh, you know, you know, I, as I mentioned to you before, I, I contrast between Santa Cruz County and, and Lake Tahoe. And like it or not, that lead cable is still sitting in the lake. And you have beautiful landlocked salmon that migrates up the fallen leaf and, and Cascade Lake out of the lake, you know, ancient species there. And um, Lake Tahoe is, it's been horribly compromised. It's not a natural environment. And a lot of folks don't understand that. You don't have Lahat and cutthroat trout in Tahoe. It's over in Pyramid. And all that dirty water from all the tourism and all the development and everything, it flows downstream to Reno and to Pyramid Lake. So the farmers in Pyramid Lake and the citizens of Reno, Sparks, they all drink it. So it's not like what you have here in Santa Cruz County where you have an ocean that could sort of kind of clean it up, but you know, your environment could be horribly abused by corporations. So I don't think I would get rid of those commissions. I would look at the commissions as something as a stopgap measure to prevent serious wrongdoing to your community. So I, I would be hesitant to get rid of the commissions, especially if it has anything to do with hazardous waste. Okay. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. Well, with that, I'll bring it back to the board for any further questions, comments, and action. Um, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I think in the name of efficiency and uh, also th that the duties of the five commissions be eliminated, I think they're going to be still covered elsewhere, in essence, uh, throughout the process, too. So. I, I feel comfortable with what we're doing. I think it's uh, the right thing to do to get more participation, actually, with less commissions. Uh, because some of these commissions had a tough time calling a meet, getting a meeting together for not just months, but years, it seems. So I, I'm supportive of this. Yep. You know, I think I'll be supportive of this, too. You know, I just want to make sure that we do have, you know, equal representation for, you know, district four, geographic location, making sure it's diverse. Um, even some of the committees that have been formed, you know, for me, I, I've seen a lot of just selection committees become echo chambers. So I wanna make sure there's diverse opinions from all over the district, including district four. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Okay, so I have a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Conan to, Conan to move the recommended actions. I'll just uh, say, Briefly, a couple comments. Um, similar to the last meeting, I did have some concern with the elimination of the Human Services Commission, and I still share those feelings, or I still have those feelings, just largely because of the fact that um, you know, one of the things that's been brought up is that while the current members who've been appointed by this board will be able to shift into that advisory body role, my understanding is that moving forward, the new selection of of um, members of that body will not be selected by board members, and so that's one thing I have concern with. I also just have concern with the 
the fact that we've talked a lot about equity and this is a, a commission that's been established to really address socioeconomic needs of low income, disabled, disadvantaged and at risk people. And they're supposed to be providing us with advice. And I think that before moving on to a different um, type of body, it, my preference would be that we would keep that body and um, we would try to figure out how to m improve it and make it better. Um, I, I talked to my commissioner and he was expressing um, wanting to stay on and, and, um, but they felt like it was kind of a done deal. I also did consult with um, with our county council because I am supportive of the other recommendations of the sons of the other four um, commissions. However, given that this is a single ordinance, in order for me to vote on those four, in support of eliminating those four, but in opposition to um, eliminating the human services commission, that would require support from the board and then to have it come back as a first reading. So in, in efficiency of time, I'll, I'm just going to register a no vote on that, but I do appreciate um, all the work that's been done. And I do think that the other four commissions, um, I do agree with them sunsetting. I think to Supervisor McPherson's point and to some of what we've heard, I think it would be good at some, some point um, when the other recommendations come back that we have a understanding of where these responsibilities are going to go. Um, you know, I think there has been some concern about Environmental Health Appeals Commission. I think it would be good to have it clearly stated where where can people go to make those complaints if we're getting rid of this commission um, with the Substance Use Disorder Commission. Where are those types of where are those conversations going to go? And my understanding is that those will go with the Mental Health Advisory Board, I guess. But I think having it clearly laid out of where some of these responsibilities are going to be shifted so that it's clear that we're consolidating these responsibilities into other um, government functions. I think it'll be helpful for the community to understand that we're not just flat out getting rid of all this, that there will be somewhere that these will go. And so with that, I'm happy to um, see if we can have a roll call vote on this item. All right. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Bren? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? No. All right, that passes with McPherson, Hernandez, Friend, and Koenig voting in favor and Cummings voting opposed. With that, we will continue to power through our meeting onto our, I believe, our last item before we go into closed session, which is item number 10, consider resolution ratifying the proclamation of a local emergency for the late January and early February 2024 atmospheric river storms as proclaimed by the county administrative officer as the director of emergency services on February 7, 2024, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. And so I'll turn it over to uh, Dave Breeden. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be very brief since the m moment this meeting started with your moment of silence through the conversations you've had for most of the agenda items, we've been discussing disaster and climate impacts. So we are here again to ratify the actions by CAO Palacios um, to, in declaring this. Um, the only distinction I'll make between this action and the action you took um, earlier in January is we are working with FEMA starting tomorrow to do our preliminary damage assessment tours. We do think that given the scale and scope of damages across the state, that a federal declaration is likely, and we will be advocating for the largest window um, of that declaration, and we'll be working with all of your offices and community to try and get both a PA declaration and an IA individual assistance declaration for the county. And with that, I'll, I'm available for questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from board members on this item? Hearing none. Unfortunately, new normal, uh, get to it as best we can. I just want to thank, uh, Mr. Breed and others for oh, doing such a, being like, oh, excuse me, for doing such a great job and making an application seven disasters in seven years is, uh, hard to realize and, uh, probably the most beautiful place to live in the planet, but we're on the coast and we're up in the hills. So, uh, that's why our work on climate change is so important. And I'm glad we're continuing to pursue that and, and uh, what we've done up to this date. Thank you, Supervisor. And I'll just kind of share those same sentiments that were expressed by Supervisor McPherson. I mean, we're just in the beginning of February, and I think we're supposed to have another storm event that's going to hit us this weekend. And so, you know, we're not really out of the rain yet, so to speak. And we'll continue to see how uh, these storms develop over the, the course of the rest of this winter and as we move into um, the uh, fires, well, the, the summer and then subsequently the fire season. I guess the one question I do have is at what point um, will the board get any kind of update on um, financial impacts from these past storms? Since it sounds like you all are going to be going out with FEMA and doing these assessments. I guess when would we anticipate getting a report back on kind of what the impacts have been during this winter storm season? Uh, 
We can certainly include during our budget presentation some more information. Current estimates are at about six and a half million dollars in damage from this these last couple storms um, for the county and about a million dollars for the city of Santa Cruz. Great, thank you. Supervisor Friend. I, I want to acknowledge uh, in particular the work of, of Public Works during this last storm. It was remarkable how fast they were able to clear out and which provides for the emergency access, provides for PG&E, provides for at and was uh, given the scope of 90 mile an hour gusts recorded in the hills, uh, your team's work in those dangerous conditions, Mr. Machado, is really admirable. And I think that the community, they're at a tipping point. Resiliency is has been tested for multiple years and in particularly challenging for those that live either directly on the coast or in the in the uh, some of the more rural areas in the mountains. I just think that people are, are at an emotional breaking point too. Of, of seeing this play out over and over and over again. And we have not just the property damage, we have just the emotional challenges that people face that have been through repeated disasters. And um, obviously I'm supportive of this this measure, but recognizing that it's just gonna continue on is very challenging. Any other questions, questions comments? Seeing none, we'll open up to the community and see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains on a one-way in and one-way out road into the woods, and it is what it is. Uh, when you live out in those areas, you just know you have to be prepared and uh, just help one another out. You, you get to know your neighbors very well. So um, I also would like to thank Public Works. Their, their crews are amazing. And um, I also want to just throw into the mix here that when these things happen, that it also threatens the uh, insurance that property owners are able to get, as well as our property values. Uh, certainly if we can't get the insurance or if we're canceled, and that's happening a lot, um, but also just when there are damages and they're not quickly responded to is what we, in, in certain areas of the county, Bonnie Doon, they've, they always seem to be last. <laughs> um, so I want to thank Public Works for their good work. Their crews are amazing. And um, I'll be interested to see how FEMA pays up on this one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any members of the public here in person who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, we'll see if there's anyone online who would like to speak to us on this item. Tim, your microphone's now available. Thank you so much again for allowing me to speak. I really appreciate it. All this has been very informative to me. Uh, just so you know, from my property near the top up here off of Miller Cutoff Road, um, <clears throat> on average, the cost has gone up to defend my property at a bare minimum with these types of storms. I'm spending, I think, some at least $5,000 every year, no problem. Uh, last couple years, somewhere between 30 and 40. So it was a lot of money. So the little bit that was offered to me from the county or whatever it is, you know, I was just laughing about that. I was just like, you know what? I need men with giant trucks and chainsaws and all kinds of equipment to fix the things on my property. From this last storm, I have to pull a redwood branch out of the out of the skylight out of my shed on the backside of my house. So, and you know, as soon as I get off, you know, out of this meeting, I'll be fixing that so the rain doesn't pour in there and allow raccoons and rats and all kinds of things into my home. Um, PG&E, the, the power lines, yes, it's a huge danger during storms to all communication and power, you know, in our mountain community up here. The 100 mile an hour winds, 90 mile an hour winds, they come right through my house with all the rain and they pound these power poles and they knock out all the power and the communication for our area. And uh, there are also issues, more tree wires should be, you know, set up on the power poles you know, in case they get down during the summer season so they don't start a fire. So there's real hazards here and real money and bucks being spent. My home is a little frightening to live in nowadays and the climate I feel has definitely changed. I can see it up in Tahoe, October snows don't happen anymore. And the types of storms, the way they're behaving, it's, it's starting to become noticeably different. So anyways, thank you so much. You folks have a fine day. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. Well, then we'll bring it back to the board for further action. Second. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Koenig. 
Uh, we'll do a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Fernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. That item passes unanimously, and that concludes our regular agenda. We have one item uh, that we'll be hearing in closed session. I'd like to ask the county council if there's anything that will be reported out on that. There may be, depending on whether the board takes action. Okay. All right. Well, then, with that, we will uh, go into closed session, and we may return uh, depending on the outcome of closed session. Recording stopped.